Seeing we have a quorum, I would like to call to order this budget hearing of the City of Bloomington Common Council for Wednesday, August 31st, 2022. Would the uh, Deputy Clerk please call the roll. Councilmember Rosenberger? Here. Volan? Sims? Here. Scambolori? Here. Sandberg? Here. Rallo? Here. Flaherty? Here. Smith? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. So we are in our uh, third night of four uh, with the, the budget hearings for considering the calendar year 2023 budget. Tonight we will hear from, the, in this order, the Bloomington Housing Authority, Housing and Neighborhood Development, Economic and Sustainable Development, Community and Family Resources, and Parks and Recreation Departments. Uh, for Anyone each of those know? departments, we will hear a presentation from the department head and have an opportunity for council member questions, uh, public comment, and council member comment or debate prior to considering a due pass recommendation. As a reminder, on Monday, the council passed a motion to limit uh, and structure debate for the duration of budget week. Uh, we specified that we would limit council member questions to no more than three minutes per council member per round of questioning limit council member comments to three minutes per presentation, and limit public comment to two minutes per speaker. We'll have public comment uh, both in the live here in the chambers and available via Zoom, and the meeting host, uh, Deputy Attorney Ash Kulak, can help to administer that. Another reminder that with the Bloomington Housing Authority um, budget, uh, the presentation is primarily for our education and benefit. Uh, we do not consider a due pass recommendation for that uh, budget traditionally because we do not actually vote on that budget ultimately as a council that is approved by the BHA board. Uh, for the others, uh, we will consider due pass recommendations. I also wanted to briefly note a little more detail about those recommendations because there's some, some procedural quirkiness here that I thought the public might benefit from. Uh, a due pass vote or motion is sort of shorthand for uh, traditionally a committee recommendation that the council do pass a piece of legislation, do pass an ordinance or a resolution. Uh, the oddity here is that we're taking votes on departmental budgets, but that's not actually the way we consider uh, the budget legislation in October. Rather, we will have three appropriation ordinances and three salary ordinances to vote on. All of the departmental budgets, for the most part, will be grouped into a single appropriation ordinance. So uh, it's, it's a little bit odd that we're not actually recommending passage of anything when we vote on a, a due pass recommendation with each departmental budget, but I think it's meant by convention to serve as a sort of bellwether for uh, how the council is feeling and an opportunity to express concerns um, and give feedback. So we will continue with that practice. I just wanted to note some of uh, th that background and detail for the benefit of the public. And I think with that, we can proceed with our First presentation for the evening, uh, I believe Ms. Kazunis uh, is going to join us to present on the Bloomington Housing Authority 2023 budget. Good evening and thank you for the part to be part here tonight. Um, my goal tonight is to give you some updates and a quick snapshot for the 23 budget goals with overall income and expense projections. This year's budget is different from prior years because we no longer own any public housing. We have sold our public housing to limited partnerships, of which um, Summit Hill, our nonprofit, is a minority holder or owner, and the Housing Authority is acting as the property manager for those units now. So we have a totally different looking budget, and um, let's get into it. So I want to start with our mission about strengthening opportunity, beginning but not ending with housing. I want to emphasize that we have a lot of resident services types of programs. One of them we call ROS, which is resident services. We are continuing that program for another two years. The funding came from public housing, and we are hoping to find other financing sources so that we can continue those uh, services to our residents. And we have a family self-sufficiency program, which basically takes people where they are and moves them into economic self-sufficiency over time. Money is escrowed with them, and it's one of the most successful ways of basically moving 
on up and on out of um, public assistance in terms of housing. So our mission is not just housing, it is services to low-income communities. Uh, we have a portfolio of projects, and this is the number of vouchers we have in Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers. The Choice Voucher Program is one where people get a voucher and they go find a um, place in the open market, and it is the number one way for deconcentrating poverty by having low-income people live wherever they wish in our community that they can afford. Uh, Single-room occupancy vouchers are a partnership that we have with Centerstone for, uh, we just manage their 12 vouchers for them. There's no uh, cost or income to us on that. Project-based vouchers are vouchers where we actually put the voucher with a unit and that voucher stays with the unit People, after they've lived there for a year, can opt into the choice voucher and move on, but that voucher always stays as basically a reserved location for low-income uh, individuals and families. We have 80 uh, supportive housing vouchers for VASH, but we have not been able to fill all of those. All of those come as a referral from the Veterans Administration, and so we're in conversations with the Veterans Administration to see if they have veterans in need, homeless veterans in need elsewhere where they could reallocate those vouchers. Emergency housing vouchers is a program where um, it actually works a little bit like rapid rehousing, and it's a very small number, but it basically means that these people are skipping all of the typical lines and are usually um, hard to house individuals or are homeless. Our family self-sufficiency program, I mentioned before, we currently have 80 families participating in our program. We have 12 families participating in the home ownership program and that's where you convert your voucher payments into mortgage payments within a whole lot of HUD rules that go with it. But nevertheless, it's a step into home ownership. Um, the Ross program, I also mentioned that before. And then we have a Head Start community building, and that's up at our Walnut Woods location. Unfortunately, right now, it is not open because Head Start has not been able to hire the teachers for early childhood learning. And we're hoping to hear shortly that that situation has changed and that there will be children in there before too long. On our 22 highlights, so this is kind of, I'm just gonna go down a list of things that we have done um, in this past year. There's a couple slides here. Um, we've increased our uh, Housing Choice HAP budget. HAP is housing assistance payments. That's the money we pay to the landlords. We've issued 27 of our 28 emergency housing vouchers. We've added project-based voucher contracts to Governor's Park and the retreat at the switchyard that just broke ground. We've closed financing for the Crestmont RAD conversion. The Walnut Woods and Reverend Butler was closed two years ago and that remodel is completely finished. And now we're in the end of the first phase for Crestmont. We've installed 80 security cameras throughout all of the property and um, this is part of our safety, health and safety effort. And we installed solar panels on the Housing Authority Administrative Building. Whoops, I went too far. Um, we um, passed our successful audit for our low income housing tax credit, which is also called Section 42. When you do tax credit compliance, you are reporting directly to the IRS and not to HUD any longer. Um, we uh, participated in a lot of training on how to do low-income housing tax credit management as opposed to public housing management. We're still not quite operating, I think, on all eight cylinders with that every now and then, or get the check engine light on tax credit management rules as opposed to um, um, public housing rules. 29% of our construction contract dollars for RAD 1 went to Section 3, or Women Minority Owned Enterprises Businesses. 
and we paid prevailing wages to all of our contract. That's also known as Davis-Bacon wages. So for next year, we're looking at increasing our expertise in operating the RAD projects. As I mentioned before, running LIDIC projects is a little bit different than it is running um, public housing. And we're still using a little bit of um, time and training dollars to get better at running the landlord, at running the uh, LIDIC properties. We have, we're on um, a very distinct plan to increase the utilization of our housing choice vouchers. Uh, earlier this year, we were only seeing about 66% of the people we gave vouchers to successfully housed. So we have increased our payment standards to the landlord by 20%. And we are going to be re-examining whether or not that was enough money to make a significant difference with our landlords. And we can raise those, stand, those payments to the landlords another, up to another 10% for room, by room type. We'll be looking hard at that analysis in October before the end of the year. We're going to continue to increase the real estate development capacity of our nonprofit development arm, Summit Hill Community Development Corporation. We've recently hired a director for real estate development, and he's also working um, right now on a land trust and creating a land trust uh, under the umbrella of the Community Development Corporation. And. Um, under the Community uh, Development Corporation, we are working with a uh, consultant from the Champlain Housing Trust on creating this uh, land trust. We are working on the project called the Early Child Care and Apartments on North Monroe. That's the old water tower site that the city is leasing to us, and we're back on track. It was sort of derailed during COVID, and now we're back on track working with our architects and our various funders to get the money to get that built. That again, will have two uh, units, two rooms downstairs for um, infant care and toddlers. And then upstairs, we're planning to build three two-bedroom apartments for low-income families and working on our coalition for community-wide safety and youth engagement. And now we're just gonna get into the budget here. Although we no longer own these properties, I thought I would show you some of the budget numbers for what we are managing. And we're looking at uh, 2 million two for operating income. That is actually just Walnut, Woods, and Reverend Butler while we are in the construction phase of Crestmont that those revenues are going to our contractor to help build. And then this offset on that is we have a total um, expense of 1.7 million. And then we have a debt service of $360,000 on that project. And unlike public housing, that's new for us because we never had debt service in our HUD projects. This gives us, just to let you know, this is about a 1.21 to a 1.24 debt coverage ratio, and our goal is a 1.15, so we have room to make a couple of mistakes. Um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, our HVCV and our VASH vouchers, we have $13 million of income, and our SRO is a uh, in and basically out, a net example, it, the money that comes in on the single room occupancy vouchers comes in, it's just a pass through, it goes right back out to our partner. We have 13,145 in expenses for the admin program for um, HCV and VASH, and then HUD holds $286,000 in reserves 
So we have a net of $66,000 there. So that 286,000, that's where our increase to our landlords would come from. We would use, we would dip into those reserves a little bit more to pay our landlords more. Um, the central cost center is basically all that's left of the housing authority admin office. And our total operating income this year is $966,000 and our operating this, uh, expenses are $939,000 for a net of $26,000. It's a little thin, but it's fine. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of the programs or these numbers. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Gazunas. Uh, do we have any questions from council members? Council member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, in your discussion about vouchers, you mentioned yes. Head Start, and you mentioned that they are no longer open now. This is, this is a program of South Central Community Action Program, is that correct? That is correct. It's the Head Start, uh, it was our community building over at Walnut Woods, Okay. and we lease it to Head Start. We provide the building to Head Start. And, that, and unfortunately, they let us know um, that they don't have the teachers to open the facility yet. So it's that particular facility? Are they Correct. open elsewhere? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. yes. Other questions from council members? Uh, council member Sims. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation, Ms. Kazunas. Um, just two questions. You talked about VAS, uh, Veteran Affairs. Yes. Supportive housing vouchers. How many did you say that you had that were unused? Um, so we have about 20. We have 60 that we have had referrals from the VA and were able to then house those people. And we don't uh, have an open waiting list for that. All of those come as referrals from the Veterans Administration. And they just have not been making those referrals lately. Is that the only source of referrals? Yes. Is so yes. they can't come from anyone else? No, but the, well, yes and no. I mean, if somebody were to bring to our attention a veteran who was in need of that type of voucher, we would send that name to the VA and let the VA do their magic and send the name back. Okay, don't well, thank you. happy to do that. No, I was asking because I, I, I think many of us are aware of unhoused veterans mm -hmm. and I didn't know the best way for them to, to seek help if they chose to do that. So, exactly. So, okay, thank you. Um, the only other question I have, you mentioned the HUD held reserves. Yes. Uh, 286,000. Yes. Is there a minimum amount of reserves that HUD expects you to keep? Um, no, actually there, there isn't. Um, there is an excessive amount that they will, you know, like mark in red and send to you in the email. But the lower the amount um, basically just indicates that you are utilizing the amount of money that they budgeted for you, and they encourage you to take that down. I'm comfortable having between one and 5% of the entire budget in reserves, but that gives me the opportunity then to react to market conditions if rents were to go up. But if you pull it down to 1%, and you need more money, I'm not shy about asking HUD for more. Okay, and, but did you, you did say that you would use some of those reserves for the contribution to landlords. Correct. So that's where some of that's coming from, is from the reserves. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, and I, I wanna ask, about how many people do you, do you help each year and then I was gonna ask a secondary question was, how, what, is there an unfulfilled need that you track uh, at the Bloomington Housing Authority? Thank yes, you. and so the, the number that we actually help is in excess of 3,000. I have an annual report that I could probably um, provide for everybody for what we did last year that actually breaks the number of uh, information like who, female head of household, male head of household, how many children are in the families by both our properties and our vouchers, and I'll be glad to get you that information for follow-up information. 
But the unmet need is, again, first and foremost, our concern would be that 33% of the people who do not find housing that meets their particular needs after we've given them a voucher. And a voucher is basically a promise to pay. Um, and it's usually more than half of what the rent is that we are paying. And so they're still not successful. So obviously we have a great need for additional affordable housing rentals. And then we have a need for the number of people that are still on our waiting list. And we close our waiting list when we have two years of names on our waiting list. And those waiting lists are for both our vouchers and for our apartments. Wow. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And yeah, if you'll send that uh, report, uh, I, I guess, to the council office, uh, it'll yeah. get distributed to us. Thank you. Certainly. Do you have any more questions from council members? Seeing none, uh, we can go to the public for comment. It looked like maybe we were having some, some audio issues there on Zoom for a moment. Uh, so for members of the public, uh, this is the Bloomington Housing Authority. Um, Budget presentation we heard, if you would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, if you have dialed in, you may need to press star nine to request to speak. And if you're having trouble, you can message the meeting host using the chat feature. Uh, a reminder also that uh, public comment is limited to two minutes per speaker. Do we have any uh, members of the public wishing to comment on this budget? Yes, we have uh, Tonda Radawan, who I will ask to unmute. If folks could please state their name for the record uh, as they begin their comment, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tonda Radawan. Um, I have a question about um, the last slide that was presented. Um, it was the one with the administrative budget that was listed. I think utilities were at 12,000 and tenant services were at 8,000. I was wondering if there could just be a little bit more information on what those tenant services are if that's an appropriate question during this time? Yes, so tenant services would be Sorry, our- Sorry, uh, as uh, a matter of um, <laughs> uh, procedural regularity, we, we, during public comment, we don't actually engage in a, a question and answer format, okay. but quite often uh, when members of the public ask a question, uh, a council member will take it up on their behalf when we come back to council member comment. Uh, okay. So sorry for the uh, confusion. And thank you, um, Ms. Radawan, for your comment. If you have any more, you still have uh, time remaining, I think. All right, thank you. And do we have any other members of the public uh, wishing to comment? I don't see any more hands on Zoom. Okay, and seeing no one here in chambers, uh, we will return to uh, the council for additional questions or debate. I see Council Member Volan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to follow up on Ms. Radawan's question. Uh, what do client services mean? So, with our, services. so we have two aspects to resident services. One of them is we have a resident council. So that is a group of individuals who actually live in our properties and who meet on a regular basis. And it is primarily a vehicle for interaction for improving their quality of life and getting basically a collective voice back to us on things that they would like to see. So we support those meetings with a small amount of, of stipend amount for those meetings to take place. And then we do things like we leverage those programs. We recently had a backpack giveaway and um, there were shoes given to children going back to school and there were school backpacks filled, filled with things. And we always keep a small amount of money and then we have just wonderful donors from around the city and the county who participate in helping us do those things. At our summer family fun night out, first one we've had in three years because of COVID, we gave away nine bikes to children on the property. And we had you know, refreshments and we had various different types of things. So it's a modest amount just to basically improve quality of life and a sense of place and belonging on the properties. Do the uh, donations 
uh, get reflected in the budget? They do not. As part of that program? Yes, I'm, we do not count that as income. We just pass that immediately through. So how does the, so there's some money that's good, devoted to a kind of tenant council and some money devoted to these programs for uh, back to school. Well, so could, the, you, could you say roughly how they break yeah, down? And, and other kinds of special events. If we were to have like a picnic in the park, we would leverage that money. Um, for instance, Kroger's always been very generous in providing you know additional foods, but we just take that money and we leverage it to provide special events and activities and resident council. Uh, well, one reason I asked is because I wonder, well, if uh, there's some way that we can perhaps uh, uh, put a little more money to it that, that can leverage more donations from the community. Is that a thought that's practical? I am not familiar with a town council doing that, but I would love to explore that possibility, of course. I mean, we have a Jack Hopkins program. I don't know if uh, there's a, a conflict that might be between, uh, you know, a, I, I don't know whether to characterize your agency as a city agency or a federal agency. It's kind of a little of both. Um, and the, what the Hopkins uh, fund does, but and but this is the kind of thing that I would open up uh, my colleagues to respond with. Councilmember Sandberg uh, might uh, be able to speak about this. Um, but if we, if there's some way that that because the program isn't reflected really in the dollars in the budget we're seeing, it's hard for us to gauge the size of this donation uh, function. So that's that's why I'm asking. And, and that's a really good point. We will start tracking the, how many dollars we leverage for these special events, and we can then separate that out between what we give to the resident council in support and what we leverage for the special events that we um, have over I the just realized that my time has run out. I, ca I couldn't see the clock. But uh, if you could follow up with us with uh, some kind of data before the actual budget legislation comes, we'd love to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions or comments from council members? No additional comments either? All right, with that, as a reminder to the public again, uh, we do not take a, a recommendation vote on this budget because the BHA board is the entity who approves it. Uh, thank you for being here tonight, Ms. Kazunas, and presenting uh, the BHA 2023 budget. Thank you for the Appreciate opportunity. It. With that, we will move on to the Housing and Neighborhood <coughs> Development Department, and I believe we have Mr. Zodi here to present that department's budget. Yeah. Allow me just a minute, council members, and get everything set up here. Um, make sure the okay, make sure the clicker's operable here. Well, good evening. It's uh, my pleasure to present uh, the 2023 proposed budget for the Department of Housing and Neighborhood Development here at the City of Bloomington. My name is John Zodi. I'm the uh, Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development uh, here at the City. And uh, we're glad to talk to you tonight about some big opportunities in housing and neighborhood development uh, here as we move through 2022 and into 2023. And want to um, start by uh, reminding those and teaching those uh, others who may not know our mission, but the HANDS, hands mission, that's what we call Housing and Neighborhood Development, the HAND Department. Uh, mission is to enhance the quality of life for Bloomington residents by developing programs, services, and partnerships with public and private organizations to preserve community character, promote safe and affordable housing, and protect neighborhood vi uh, vitality. We also staff uh, the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Board of Housing Quality Appeals, and the CDBG Citizens Advisory Committee, which is an annual process that a number of council members are involved with as well. We have 17 uh, great full-time staff, some of whom are here and online tonight. Uh, some of our program management staff and finance staff are on. I want to thank them for all their work in addition to all their colleagues. Uh, I also want to thank the legal department. Um, Hand does a lot of things, and we have used no less than five attorneys from the legal department in various <laughs> cases this year with all the activity we do. So I want to uh, be sure to thank them. Pardon me just a minute. 
and uh, all that they do, as well as the rest of the departments that engage in affordable housing activity, uh, does a great deal to help advance the ball forward on housing, and uh, we're very grateful for their advice and guidance uh, in hand. So we, uh, as you may know, we do uh, the rental inspection program, the neighborhood compliance and program services is a big part of what we do, historic preservation, community development block grant dollars, uh, home investment partnership funds, housing counseling and home ownership assistance, affordable housing and, ho and the housing development fund, and sort of new programming that came online last year, of course, American Rescue Plan Act dollars, Home ARPA, which is a, a separate allocation uh, we'll be happy to talk about later, and of course, our ED Lit uh, proposed uh, funds. Uh, just some background. Uh, additional background on efficiencies. So we are in the process of digitizing our files. This is a big deal in hand. We have 11,000 rental files sitting in our office right now. We are in the process of digitizing those using uh, already existing department funding that we're not asking for additional funds for. And I'll also point out, uh, I think it's been noted pr previously that our inspection staff, our seven neighborhood compliance uh, member team are inspecting 27% more rental units than they were when we last added to that team. So 2010 to 2022, uh, there are 27% more rental units in the city of Bloomington than there were, and those are increasing by the day. So we are uh, trying to do as much as we can with what we've got, and we we'll always want to make sure we point out those efficiencies. In the field of equity, I think it's important to point out, to remind people, as the rental inspection program um, has gone through some scrutiny at the state level the last year. It's important to state this. If you are a renter and living within the confines of the city of Bloomington in a rental property, you are entitled to safe housing no matter your rent. This is an issue of housing security, housing safety, and equity. And so we want to point that out. This is, we have 28,000 rental units in the city of Bloomington, and it is important to note uh, why that is important. So many reasons but housing security, equity, and safety is a big one there, and I wanna make sure to state that uh, for those of the public and, and all of you as well. Um, we're also participating in diversity, equity, inclusion training. I'm doing that as a department head, and we uh, did some training as a department last year, but I'm looking forward to additional uh, steps there that the administration's taking. On the sustainability front, uh, we've gotta do our part, and I think, uh, wanna thank our uh, historic preservation staff and economic and sustainable development who are collaborating on both uh, n helping neighborhoods update their historic guidelines to reflect adaptation and we have s a more solar activity. So since 2016 we've had 30 petitions to adaptively reuse historic buildings with solar panels. So people putting solar panels on their houses for instance have come through the HPC. We also have our neighborhood cleanups, uh, which have uh, recovered a lot of tonnage, uh, diverted it from a landfill, removed it from the neighborhood. That's very exciting. And then climate action goals, I wanted to be more intentional about this in the next year, looking at the climate action plan and seeing w in what other ways hand can align with the climate action plan. I've got some notes on that, but uh, haven't moved very far on that yet. And I'm looking at my timer, not my phone, in case anybody's wondering. Just want to be respectful of, uh, of time here. So. Um, so we want to be more intentional about our climate action participation in the next year. So for 2022, uh, we have completed our two neighborhood cleanups, McDowell Gardens and Eastern Heights. Uh, we launched, launched a pilot program to involve more students in neighborhood activities. We did a block party uh, on August 16th. Councilmember Volan stopped by there. Thank you for that. We've completed our CDBG funding for the 2021 program year. Uh, HUD program year runs differently than, than the city fiscal years, you may know, so we are done with that, and we've, of course, provided administrative oversight uh, and help with uh, the Jack Hopkins funds that the council uh, awarded as well. We uh, continue to leverage collaboration between planning, ESD, and HAND, especially to stimulate additional units of affordable housing. Certainly the Hopewell project is a big, uh, is a big expenditure of, of effort uh, for good reason with that uh, once in a generation opportunity we have here in Bloomington. Uh, we're conducting on-site uh, annual monitoring of dedicated units. I wanna, this goal is changing. We are doing an annual monitoring of all affordable and workforce units. So we sort of amended this goal and we're expanding that a little bit. Uh, we've assisted three households with home ownership uh, through the city's down payment uh, shared equity program. Thus far, uh, we've uh, helped about 50 people uh, come through the Home Buyers Club class uh, and uh, we'll, we'll survey them by the end of the year to, 
to gauge their experience. And then we've conducted um, about 900 cycle inspections of uh, rental permits uh, here in Bloomington thus far this year with a goal of 1,450. So for 2023, looking ahead, we want to uh, continue uh, aligning our goals with planning and transportation and economic and sustainable development uh, to create a, a minimum of 140, or excuse me, 180 affordable or workforce units uh, each year. So that's our goal each year based on the 2020 housing study. I want to take this opportunity to note uh, on Monday evening, I think President Sandberg asked about the breakdown of units thus far, 1,121 units have been added or in progress by the administration six, since 2016. There's a chart on page four of your budget memo that lays out where those are and the number of units. And we have income information that I can provide later um, as well. Uh, and so we wanna uh, continue to do that monitoring. We've set up a process uh, that we have, are uh, working on now that will help, uh, I can explain that further later, but we'll, we'll continue that goal into 23. Uh, and assist more households with home ownership using our federal funding as well as our city funds. We will continue our cycle uh, inspection goal. Um, between 1,200 and 1,450 permits will expire in any given year. And so that's why that number is important. So our inspection staff does a lot more inspections. We've done um, uh, quite a few over the cycle inspection. I can explain that if you have uh, uh, questions about it. but. Uh, through those inspections thus far this year, through cycle, complaints, uh, re-inspections, we've identified about 13,000 violations. Uh, and a lot of those um, are, can be minor, but quite a few, of course, were life safety. And that's just restating the importance of the rental inspection program and providing safe housing. So we want to continue our community partnerships with neighborhoods and landlords and others to focus on outreach and education on Title VI, which is our neighborhood compliance, and Title 16, which is rental inspection maintain and enhance metrics for safe and affordable housing, and train on the new InterGov software that's coming online. That's a big, big deal for our department, and we'll uh, create a lot of uh, new systems that we don't have right now. And then, of course, respond to you reports in, in three days. We want to try to get that number down and, and uh, make sure we're, we're being uh, mindful of constituent uh, response. Here we go. Title Eight for historic preservation. Oops, pardon me. There we go. Uh, increase educational outreach efforts to reach 50 new residents. A lot of this got hung up from COVID, so we want to get that going again. And our uh, Gloria Colombrania, our program manager, is working hard on that. We want to see more solar, right? So this is a really important thing to adaptively reuse to stay in a historic building and get uh, solar on there. So we're continuing to work on that. And uh, ESD and uh, HAND will continue to collaborate on the Urban Enterprise Association facade and green home improvement uh, funding, or BG HIP. Neighborhood and citizen involvement, uh, we want to continue to make measurable contributions to climate action goals. So we diverted about three tons of waste from the landfill with our cleanups this year, and, about, and we removed about 12 tons of waste from the neighborhood collectively. So we wanted to keep doing those things. We think that's a measurable goal, uh, and we'll also work on invasives partnering. Uh, I know the council knows we've been making some effort on bamboo. We want to continue to work with community groups and educate on the issue of invasive uh, species on properties. Fund neighborhood uh, projects through our neighborhood improvement grants and small and simple grants. Continue development of our B-Town neighboring project, which is expanding um, a little further out uh, from Elm Heights, which is where it started, and then we'll do some more on that in the coming year as well. With our federal programming, as you know, we are an entitlement city. Um, that term only means we are entitled to the funding because we are a city of 50,000 in population or more. That's what that term means in, in federal government terms. And so because of that, we get an allocation of funding through um, a housing counseling program, through community development block grants, and through the home investment partnerships. And, and uh, those, all three of those programs run very differently, but we want to make sure we are uh, getting that money uh, awarded in the right way, in a timely fashion, and making sure that the program management attached to those uh, programs is efficient and that our, our subrecipients, the organizations to whom we award the grants, uh, and you do uh, through council action, um, that they have a, a good system in place to uh, spend that money. It's a very complicated money. It's not always very flexible, and so it's really important we have structures in place to help them do that, and so that's a, that's a big job. So the highlights for the budget uh, this year, ran through our goals. 
Uh, our request this year is higher. Uh, $4.7 million is the hand department's budget request. It's an overall increase of uh, $3.2 million or 207% from 2022, and I'll get to that and why. Uh, in category one, uh, personnel services, we have a $1.2 million ask, and this represents a 14% uh, increase over 2022, largely because we are asking for a new program man manager position to focus on affordable housing programming, uh, plus the COLA, COLA adjustments uh, for staff. Category two, uh, supplies, uh, represents an increase of about 100%. Um, largely due to uh, fuel costs, as well as new tablets for our neighborhood compliance staff. We have uh, been using tablets for inspections, uh, and with our new software coming online, it's time for new tablets, and so those are quite expensive, and that's where you'll see that increase. On other services, this is where I'll go into some more detail. Um, this is a significant increase of about $3 million, or 693% over 2022. Uh, largely due to the $2.1 million in housing development funds that we are asking to be appropriated forward, uh, which is part of the balance in the fund right now, as well as $1,047,000 requested in ED lit dollars. There's also separately $1.4 million remaining in ARPA funds to program, so we had three, about $3.5 million allocated, excuse me, appropriated through ARPA last year. We are still programming and spending that that money down, um, and there's some detail on that in your, in your budget memo as well. So what are we gonna do with this ED lit money, housing development funds, if, if it is appropriated forward uh, by our request? Uh, last year we talked about three buckets that we sort of uh, organize our housing efforts into, increasing housing security, continue to support efforts to make homelessness rare, brief, and non-repeating. Uh, we have, um, as, as you know, uh, committed $2.7 million to uh, Heading Home Initiative. I think I see Mary Morgan here tonight. Uh, and those efforts are important and ongoing. Um, there's also an additional position being requested that would be housed in Community Family Resources, I'll, I believe, and I will uh, wait for Director Callender Anderson to go into detail on that, but these funds would help uh, pay for that position, as, er, that position as well. So increasing housing security, looking at what we can do there over the next year. Developing rental housing. In your memo, there's some detail here too, but I believe that uh, looking at the housing development fund and the need to uh, make that a little more robust, uh, not giant, but a little more robust over the next year, uh, increasing funding that could go in there to increase the supply and the access, access to rental housing is really important uh, by creating incentives uh, and also doing rental outreach and education. That new position I'm asking for uh, through uh, the budget this year would be paid for out of, out of ED lit dollars, as you'll see in, your, in the budget. And then advancing home ownership, this is a big one. Um, trying to assist first time home buyers with purchase, we really wanna get that number up uh, of people who are looking, how many more people can we put into a position to buy a house that might otherwise be sort of um, beat out in the market, right? They aren't in a position to offer cash or uh, be, you know, have a lot of liquid assets. So how can we help them, put them in a position to do that? And we really wanna amp that up over the next year. Uh, and so with that comes, where are they gonna go? What houses are they gonna buy? We're looking at the development on Arlington Park Drive, of course. There's article in the paper yesterday about it you probably saw and then of course the Hopewell project which is a multi-year development. We also work with existing stock and this is really important to point out as well. Um, when we're looking at homeowners who may be wanting to age in place or maybe uh, first maybe a, a new buyer who like me can't do much uh, handiwork needs some help and if they meet the proper income they may be able to uh, get uh, funds to rehab, do a rehab project on their home, a new roof, new HVAC, uh, if you're uh, in need of a wheelchair ramp, something like that. Really important to work with our existing housing stock too and make sure people can stay in those homes if they own them. It's a really important thing to focus on. It's also not, uh, the numbers aren't great. So we have about 25 rehabs in the pipeline right now out of all the houses in Bloomington, but really important to focus on that and that's what home ownership is about is looking at each household, what can we do for that household, and how many need help, and where are we in that, um, in that pipeline of increasing home ownership and people moving from one place to another if they desire to do so. So total request you'll see again is uh, $1,047,000 for ED Lit, housing development funds, 2.1 million. 
And here you'll see the, the charts uh, with our overall summary and our, our categories, one through 400. And then our uh, department by budget by fund. So you'll see the new position uh, paid for by ED lit in the 100 category. And then the, now the request in the 300 category, the $961 is the remaining amount from the 1,047,000. And then of course the 2.1 million for housing development funds. So in conclusion, uh, we, uh, our budget request, we hope, works to sustain our efforts at developing programs, services, and partnerships with public and private organizations to again preserve community character, protect neighborhood vitality, and promote safe and affordable housing now and in the future. And I wanna say again this year, I said it last year during my presentation, but all with a really big sense of urgency. The, the clock is ticking and people need housing now. We got an email last night, ESD got it, forwarded over to us. Someone said, I need affordable housing. So, you know, this is, this is a now problem and something that we consider to be very urgent. And so uh, we do that, we make these efforts with the intention of acting uh, now and in the future and appreciate your consideration of our request tonight and be glad to answer uh, any of your questions. So thank you. And thanks again to the HAND staff who does a tremendous amount of work on behalf of the city uh, every day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zodi, for the presentation. Do we have questions from council members? Uh, council member Scambolari. Yes, thank you for the presentation, a lot going on. Um, I appreciate what you've laid out in the budget book on new revenue investments. And in particular, I wanna dig in a little bit to the amount devoted to rental housing and the amount to home ownership. Those amounts are fairly similar. There's about a 10% difference. But could you say more about um, how you decide where to place emphasis sure. between rental housing and home ownership. Thanks for the question, Council Member Scambolari. The simplest way I would say how we think about this is, um, and something I've talked to some of you about, is how you get a household in the position of home ownership versus a rental situation, right? So we, most of the development projects that come through uh, are rental housing, right? So there's more incentives, there's other things that they might do, there's private development, market rate, and sometimes there's affordability or workforce units in there. Um, sometimes we have to be more, um, I guess, proactive on home ownership, and because it's so much more um, uh, sort of diffuse. So for instance, in June, on June 9th, we broke ground on the retreat at Switchyard Project, which is gonna be 48 units total of 64, 48 units of affordable rental housing uh, that will open hopefully in the fall of 2024. So there's 48 households that will have affordable housing. So when you translate that and say, okay, how do we get 48 households into home ownership, right? There's a little more, you gotta dig in and say, where are, where are the areas we can do that? Is it, is it existing housing? Is it new housing over here? Uh, is it a completely a uh, blank canvas piece of property that we need to increase housing there. So I think it requires a little more uh, proactive intention, if you will. And so when we make those um, investments, for instance, uh, you might be referring to, I recommend um, 200,000 uh, for rental housing focus on the housing development fund, whereas we put 250 in for home ownership. That's one of the differences. Because how do we create more incentives for uh, home ownership, basically, to be uh, more intentional. And also looking at um, what the impact is on our neighborhoods, right? So we've got uh, houses, I talked about the 25 rehabs that are all over the city. How does, how does that make a difference in our neighborhood? What else do we need to do as we're doing this work in neighborhoods? How can we work with the neighborhoods and uh, how do we look at design and everything else? And I think it's a long-term strategy. So um, that's where we sort of focus those efforts a little more in home ownership on the financial side. Hold my, I don't have much time left, so I'm gonna hold my question till round two. Additional questions from council members? Um, yes, council member Piedmont-Smith. Yes, um, in regard to the neighborhood cleanups, and mm -hmm. I saw you at our neighborhood <laughs> cleanup, so thank yeah, you. Thank you. Um, I uh, was wondering, you, you were talking about how many tons were diverted from the landfill, mm -hmm. but how do you measure that? Because if somebody doesn't bring it to neighborhood cleanup, they may bring it to the recycling center or they may bring it to uh, the salvage yard. I mean, do you just assume that everything that's brought to the cleanup is would otherwise be in the landfill? No, we do. 
So if I'm understanding your question correctly, if someone, if it doesn't come through the cleanup, then we don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get measured, okay? So we don't have recycling at cleanups as you, as you and I have discussed, um, but we have, um, uh, you know, the, we have the sanitation truck there um, that is able to measure. Um, we have the um, sort of uh, reuse pile. So if somebody has uh, a wheelbarrow or a, you know, um, a couch or something that isn't something to go in the trash or the, the, the uh, sanitation truck, but might be reused by someone. Um, and then uh, that uh, when, we, when we do brush collection, so cut, chop down brush and do all the limbs, all that is ma uh, measured. And so that's what's diverted either from the landfill or the waste that's removed from the neighborhood. So does that answer your question? So when you say, uh, I don't remember the tonnage, but you said so many tons were? Almost 13 tons, I believe, or 12 tons, excuse me was so, removed this year. So that was, that did not include what went in the sanitation truck? Oh, it should include that. So it was Okay, so that, from. because that sanitation truck ends up, that stuff ends up in the landfill. So that's why I'm Maybe I'm, Angela, to. is that, uh, let me ask a program manager. Okay, excuse me, that was, yeah, it's everything except what was in the trash truck then. Oh, okay. The uh, sanitation truck, so I was incorrect. Okay. All yeah. right, that's great. Sorry, I misunderstood. Sorry about that. Um, Thank you, Angela. Angela Van Roy, program manager. <laughs> yeah. Um, my other question is uh, about the ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that you'd be requesting, well, I'm, I'm a bit confused. I thought in your presentation tonight you said $1.4 million in ARPA funding. In, um, then there's the home ARPA funds. Sure. Are those two different buckets, and, and what are those for? Yeah, so they aren't, uh, they aren't being requested tonight. Um, the $1.4 oh. million dollars is already appropriated for 2022. I just wanted to be oh. uh, clear on what we had left over from that $3.5 million uh, allocation or appropriation, I should say, that you did last year. So we're still working on that $1.4 million or so. We've programmed out some. That, that includes what's been done out of that $3.5 million includes uh, money that will go to the Heading Home Initiative later this year, $1.5 million, that kind of stuff, where we are uh, already spending down that ARPA money. Home ARPA is a different allocation of money that came to the city through the American Rescue Plan Act. And so this is similar to um, ARPA dollars. Uh, the city has, basically has the money. Um, we don't have to apply for it or anything like that. What we do have to do, and this is specifically targeted toward uh, vulnerable populations to assist uh, in, in those who are unhoused and uh, working on veterans issues and things like that. So what's required uh, for that, that is $2 million uh, that, is, that is allocated to the, the uh, city. We are the participating jurisdiction for HUD, so that, that's the city, and as the participating jurisdiction, that was our allocation uh, through HOME ARPA. And so what is required to utilize that money, we have several years to use, utilize it, uh, about seven or eight years at this point, I think. And we have to uh, put together what's called an allocation plan. So what'll start this fall is outreach to um, community organizations that work with vulnerable populations. So the continuum of care agencies, uh, all of those, those folks who work with that population of, of people who are in need of service. Uh, to put together that allocation plan. So how are we going to use that money, basically, is that plan that will be, uh, that work will start uh, this fall. So that's money that's uh, above and beyond what is uh, being requested tonight, and it's, it's uh, federal dollars, obviously. So the, the remaining 2.1 million of regular ARPA, you're not asking to appropriate that as part of? Of ARPA? Of, yeah. Of the regular, I'm sorry, my time is up. So, so you, oh, no, that's okay. Let me respond if that's all right. So, fair. there's, we aren't requesting any more ARPA money to be appropriated this year for hand. Okay. okay. So, no, the only, the two additional requests besides general fund is $2.1 million in housing development funds, which as you know are local, and then the $1,047,000 in ED lit. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Uh, Councilmember Smith. And then Councilmember Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could we hear a little bit about what um, Housing Security Group has plans for that 1.5 million? Sure. And you know what? I may tonight. I want to tell you. Um, I believe on this council schedule we have an update scheduled. Uh, I think Ms. Morgan and her staff are going to be updating you on the Heading Home Initiatives. Uh, 
efforts on September 21st before the council. So I may defer, or be happy to answer follow-up questions if you have them in writing, uh, Council Member Smith. So uh, they're doing a lot. Uh, I think um, uh, Built for Zero is a big effort that they're engaging in, and so I don't want to steal Mary's thunder there, but uh, there is a planned update for council, I believe, in uh, on September 21st. So Yeah, that's very exciting. So thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate yep. it. Mary's still here. And sorry, Councilmember Roland, I actually uh, missed Councilmember Sandberg's ham, hand, gonna go with her first. So Councilmember Sandberg, then Councilmember Roland. And I appreciate the uh, chart on what I had asked for prior to the hearings tonight about uh, the affordable uh, units that are added. Um, what I would like in addition to, and you said that there's gonna be more income info that you're gonna provide for us later. Right, and there's, a, there's a chart we'll get you that has the income distribution of how affordable, like what, what does affordable mean? Are they workforce or are they 80% and right. we, have a, we have a chart we can get you there. So all these things that are listed by year, they are, they are in the category of affordable housing or is it a mix of affordable and the workforce? It's a mix of affordable and workforce. It's a mix. Yeah. And then again, you've got several different um, developments that are listed per year and I'd like to kind of get a breakdown of how many units per those developments in addition to the, you know, you've just got Switchyard, Brownstone Terrace, mm -hmm. et cetera, if we could get an idea of where, you know, these affordable units are. So what, we'll, what we have, let me make sure this comports with what you're asking for. We'll have the total number of units, mm -hmm. and then how many units are in each income category. Is that what you're asking for? Right. Okay. Yeah, we'll right. have that Thank for you me. for that. Um, and then you mentioned earlier that you are monitoring wor workforce housing that you've not yet had an opportunity to do. Are those the units that are in the uh, developments where there was a, uh, an arrangement where a certain percentage of those units would be workforce, mm -hmm. but then it's hands responsibility to kind of go in and make sure all that's being done appropriately? It's yes, primarily. So let me kind of go through that a little bit, if I may. Um, we are monitoring, we, so this list basically that you have in front of you um, of 1,121 units. Um, if you look at that number as a total, each there's a number of projects that make up that total. Those projects uh, we are monitoring uh, on an annual basis, we are going to be monitoring on an annual basis. Some of that's, some of the workforce monitoring has been done previously, so I wanna make that clear. Um, but we think it's important to monitor all affordable and uh, you forgive me if I sort of lump workforce into affordable. I believe it's a big category that we need to focus on. So when I say affordable and workforce, um, so the department is, uh, so I'll just uh, tell you what we've done. So we are creating a process where we send communication to all of those projects, properties, who have affordable or workforce units on site. And we, we have a sheet that says, fill them in, like, are you still doing you committed to 34 affordable or workforce units. Are you still doing that? Are they still this income band? Please respond to us by October 1st uh, to your, as to your efforts. That's, the, that's what we're doing in the hand department. Uh, you'll also uh, probably know that many affordable units, if they have home dollars, if they're a low-income housing tax credit project, if they've received a tax abatement, um, ESD reported on those to you all in June, um, they are required to do separate reporting. So if it's a low-income housing tax credit or, or low-income housing tax credit project or LIHTC, as, as the acronym is, um, they're reported, required to report to the state as well. So we are trying to figure out the best system there. Mm -hmm. This is what we started for this year to see how it works and then we'll amend it. Uh, we want to make it uh, practical. Um, we don't want to have people double and triple reporting the same information if we can avoid that. So that's the effort we've started uh, in hand. Good, I'm at my time, but I'll have a follow-up later, thanks. Okay, thank you. Council Member Rowland. Well, I'd respectfully ask Council Member Samper to get out of my head because she asked all the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, I appreciate, I, I'm looking forward to the same uh, uh, breakdown of, um, of that table on uh, page four. Uh, but I wanted to go back to page two and get some clarification um, uh, about the basic number of units there are in the city and how many of them are affordable. Um, uh, there's a line that says, uh, the 2020 Housing Study Commission by the City of Bloomington set a goal of having 2,592 more units of housing by 2030. I think that's referring to affordable units of housing. Is that right? Uh, 
It is, it is not. The, that's a total number. There's a subset of those that are um, <clears throat> that are affordable, uh, council member. So. And yet, nearly, nearly so, three thousand more units of rental housing have been created since 2020. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear that last part. Well, the next sentence: Since 2020, nearly 3,000 more units of rental housing have been created, with more than 450 being affordable. Mm -hmm. So, how do you reconcile the goal of having 2,500, 2,600 more units of housing altogether in the next 10 years, when in the past two years we've had more than that built? Mm -hmm. So, the first answer to your question is the subset. So, the 2,592 is a 970 affordable owner occupied and 808 affordable. So when we look at how the numbers work, so those don't always align just so because the housing study was done in 2020 and we say, okay, since 2020, what have we done? That's 3,000 more units of rental housing, uh, both affordable and market rate. It doesn't talk about home ownership in there. So that's, that's where we're just trying to give you an idea of where we track on that goal. We've still got a lot of work to do on creating um, the total number of housing. Well, let, let me stop you there because I, I, that your answer doesn't really answer my question. That, okay. like, uh, it's, it's not clear to me. From It says, uh, again, I'll read the sentences, 2,592 more units of housing by 2030, but have been created nearly 3,000 more units since 2020. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, I, I'm already running out of time, but I just wanted to bring this up and to try to get clarity about, I mean, because I'd love to know what the actual numbers are. Like, you know, how many housing units are there in the city? How many of them are rental? Uh, we know better than the census apparently knows how many people live in the city and how many units there are. That's a strong indication of how many people there are in the city. So uh, this basic set of figures it, it, you know, I would like to see the same kind of clarity that you're bringing to uh, the table that Councilmember Sandberg talked about. And let's let's bring it up on another question. I'm out of time for now, but I'll come back to this in another question. May I seek? Oh, excuse me, Deputy. Uh, may I seek some clarification? Let, let's let, let, let me, or do we need to move on? Yeah. Um, we can come back to it. Okay. Since Councilmember Volan's time is up, if you had a short reply, but Thank if you're you. still unclear, let's come back to it. Well, I just wanted to. Yeah, I, just, I was a little unclear. I just want to make sure I'm getting down what he's asking. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah, please, please clarify. Yeah, so council member, can I ask a little, just for a little bit more clarification, you wanna know uh, how many rental units we have in the city of Bloomington uh, right now? Is that is that helpful information? I'd like to know how many units there are in the city of Bloomington, then how many rental units. I know you may not know that figure, it may require planning to intervene here, but uh, I mean, unless the only number we can rely on is the Census Bureau's measure of the number of housing units in the city, but uh, I would hope that the hand department would at least know how many total units of housing in the city since even non-rental units are of some nominal concern to your department. Well, I think I can answer that question. I just want to make sure I'm answering what you're asking. So if, if Perhaps, I heard you correctly, okay. so do you want me to come back? Perhaps clarifying in writing might be the most helpful. Okay. And or. Um, right. Yeah, in, in a follow-up I think I have round. an answer to his question, but I'm just, I just want to make sure. So, okay. <laughs> it seems well, like we're, we're right, yeah, let's, missing. Let's come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Councilman Morallo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zodi, for your presentation. I have mm -hmm. two questions. The first one is, um, knowing that we've added thousands of new rental units, I'm concerned about the rental inspection program and whether you have sufficient staff mm -hmm. in order to meet the needs of the periodic inspection. Mm -hmm. so, is that your question? That's one question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we believe that we always uh, will, um, the staff works very hard. Um, we are keeping up on our inspections. We, it, is, it is manageable. I wouldn't say we are overwhelmed by, uh, there are no inspections not getting done, right? So we have done a lot with increased units. We've found ways to make those more efficient as property owners are in the system longer. Sometimes the, you know, we know them and they know how the system works and violations may change. So it's a very dynamic situation, let me say that. I never want to, I never want to say to anyone that I, I wouldn't take more help, but I think in this area we have shown that we can be efficient with the uh, units we have and more coming online. And the team 
uh, works very hard. They're out every single day in all types of weather, as you know, doing that. Um, so the team as we are is fine. I will tell you when annexation was proposed and depending on where the litigation goes, we would uh, believe we would need additional inspection staff if, uh, if annexation were to go through and that was part of the financial analysis last year. So um, hope that answered your question. Uh, I think it does. Um, my other question is about clarity, uh, specificity regarding the $3.5 million request from the Housing Development Funds and ED Lit. It, it, it appears as though the ED Lit is covered in a table called Potential New Revenue Investments Proposal. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That I see an itemization of the, that on page 186? Um, Am I reading that correctly? Are you, are, you, are you in your hand, Budget Memo, Council Member? Yes. Is it in your the, the table in your memo? It's on it's on page thirteen of the memo. If that's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the it, same that thing. corresponds yep. to one eighty six in our budget. Yes. Yep. So that's that's from ED Lit. How mm -hmm. about the housing development funds? The two point one million. Yeah. Can so we have specificity regarding that? And you only have thirty seconds to respond. Perhaps okay. you might want to. Um, let me say this. Uh, November 16th will be my scheduled my annual report to you on the housing development fund activity. So I'll say that first. Um, one thing we've been able to do this year, there wasn't housing development fund money appropriated for this year. So we've been able to use some ARPA money to do activities that otherwise would have been done out of housing development. So that's my answer in uh, 20 okay. seconds. Okay, maybe we can correspond about this because I'd like to know specifically what these funds will be targeted to do. Moving forward, okay. yep. Thanks. There'll be some projects coming online and then uh, we want to be ready to respond and be nimble to those that would come online as well. Thank you for the report, Mr. Zodi. Mm -hmm. And I um, also commend your staff. They do a lot. Um, and I will also submit many of the other questions I have later. There's a format that we submit questions, so you'll get some sure. of those there. But for tonight, um, first of all, your 2022 budget goals update. And you talked about 60 home or households, graduates of home buyers class by the end of the quarter last year. Was it, did you meet that? Yes. Yeah, we oh. see. So the 2022 goal we're talking about? Yes. Yes, yeah, so we had close to 100, I think, that went through the Home Buyers Club last, last so you, year. So you have a pool of people that are waiting for down payment dollars or, or, well, they're so, coming or do, through or do they, we just accumulate a pool of people in case there's Yeah, so there are a lot them. of steps they go through to go into the home buying process and one of those is to go through our home buyers club it's sort of a you know certification that they go through and so uh, we want those folks to get into housing as soon as possible some of them find houses outside of the city but that is a we do those classes multiple times a year so that they can get that done as part of their their education program to become first-time home buyers are we working with folks on the other aspects of getting a home owner's loan and these sorts of things other than a home buyers class i know there's a lot of components but we've got a pool of people that are waiting. How do we plan to help them going on into the future? Yeah, that's something I want to increase with uh, uh, our efforts next year because there's a lot of education we can do. Um, every, every time we build a relationship with a lender on the shared equity program, for instance, that the city has, we see results from that. And results, I mean, we see one maybe come up in the pipeline. So uh, it's taken some time to get lenders comfortable with some, some lenders comfortable with the shared equity model. Um, also down payment assistance programs, depending on the financing of the homeowner, that can get kind of complicated. I'll tell you the um, last week, um, a state agency reached out after seeing the first responder, you know, the, the incentives we have for housing for our law enforcement officials uh, reached out to us to see how we could partner better on, uh, on our other down payment assistance programs. So there's a lot of outreach that can be done and we'd like to do in the next year. I think there's a real opportunity there. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have another question I'll get in the next round, but to finish my time, um, you mentioned in your report about DEI training and mm -hmm. you as a department head. And we've talked before, one of my concerns is more institutional as opposed to individuals. But in your role of this training, how is this being matriculated down to your staff? Yeah. Is there, is there a plan? Is this throughout the administration? or So what's happening with that? Well, it's, uh, when it's completed, I want to 
be part of the effort to see how it's going to be disseminated through the staff. We did uh, some training last year as a department. Uh, haven't done uh, much on that uh, through this through the Center for Equity and Inclusion's training, particularly. I'm, as that program finishes up, I want to see what the next steps will be, and we'll be obviously supportive of that because I think it's critically important. Um, but I haven't done much training of the staff thus far from what I've learned in, in that just yet. Okay, thank you. My time's up. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. For presentation. I have a few questions. I'll probably go a couple rounds. Um, you mentioned, you know, everyone has like a right to a habitable, habitable home if they are a renter or a homeowner, I guess. Um, but I really worry about retaliatory rent increases, and I think that's a, a big reason why folks do not report something that's wrong in their home. Do you know if um, we have any ordinances that prevent, prevent that or if the state preempts us from doing that? Um, because I think it's a protection that folks might need. Mm -hmm. I'd have to find out and uh, let you know. We do, um, our complaint inspection system is one that requires a a call to come in, um, and so that's something we are sensitive to, but need to get back to you on that one. Okay. And then, I guess piggybacking on Councilmember Rollo, just t thinking about enforcement in general, and not just the, you know, not just certifying rentals, but I think during the UDO discussions, there was just a lot about, um, we have really good rules in place, but often it's hard to enforce them, right? So, like, anything from right, trash in yards or trash bins on the road or couches on porches or the noise ordinance and you know all, all of those things. Like, do you think we, kind of Rollo's question, do you think we have enough folks to, on staff to really enforce all of the rules that we have in place to keep mm. neighborhoods quiet is the wrong word, but. Well, I, I think you know, our, neighbor, our inspectors, our rental inspectors are also our neighborhood compliance officers, so they're, we have uh, you know, the uh, 28,000 rental units uh, in the city that are inspected uh, every few years, every four years, every five years. And then there, each, each compliance officer is assigned, as you probably know, uh, a zone of the city that is their area. And those change every year so that they're able to rotate, get to know the, the different areas of the city. So um, I think the number of citations written and, and the uh, knowledge they gain in their neighborhoods is, I think we're doing fine there. Um, uh, leave it up to others whether we are, you know, adequately enforcing this ordinance or that one. But as far as Title VI goes, which is the neighborhood compliance stuff, I feel uh, pretty comfortable that when uh, we get a constituent response or we get a call um, that uh, our staff is ready to go out and they're able to respond very quickly to those. And they make an effort to do so, uh, we'll say. they. Um, this week, you know, it's August, so we've had a lot of students move in and a lot of things coming up. And, uh, you know, over the weekend, I asked somebody to, hey, can you go check this out? And first thing Monday, and I mean, they're able to be on stuff and be, and be pretty responsive. So we're very proud of that. And I think uh, as Title VI goes and to Title 16 goes to uh, elaborate on Council Rollins' question, I think we're doing fine. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I've got one. Um, I wanted to follow up about the Housing Development Fund a bit more. Uh, first of all, just a, a point of clarification, I, I think I may be seeing three different terms for the same fund uh, throughout the budget book, and I wanted to confirm if that my understanding is correct there. So it's called the Housing Development Fund within your budget memo. I think it's called Affordable Housing in the chart, um, the sort of large chart on page four of the budget book, and then in a chart that was added to the budget book, uh, at council members' request, uh, highlighting some revenue sources for certain funds. I think it's called housing trust. Um, do you know if those are all the th same thing? I believe that I would, I would want to see it before I confirm it, but I believe generally they're all the same. Okay. So uh, the housing trust was a different right. historic fund. And right. So that's, I want to make sure the terminology is all the same. What's most important there is obviously the dollar amounts is attached right. to it. So but I think they're. Oh. Oh, thank you. Oh, Jeff's there, yes. Pardon me, Jeff. Perfect. Phone and a friend. Uh, yes, uh, Council Member Flaherty, those are all the same. Uh, okay. they, the names kind of get interchanged, but those are all the same funds, same okay. fund. Thank you, and then the follow-up on that is, is a bit more clarity or detail with respect to uh, the revenue sources that, that go into that fund, whether it's um, 
a funds transfer or something else in the chart that was added. Uh, it's, I think it's page 15 of the updated budget book. Uh, it says major fund, major contributions or major sources of revenue for it are contributions and housing loans. Could you, you describe what those two um, sources are? Sure. So the first is loans. We have a number of loans, and I'll, I'll either get you that information and follow up and what loans those are and how much, or I can give you that update in November when I come back. Um, but we have loans that we have with those who are engaging in affordable housing development. We'll issue them a low interest loan, and so those are the payments coming in. The contributions, which this fund, just this year, so we received a contribution from uh, uh, the developer of the um, complex on North Walnut Street, uh, Verve, I think. Uh, it is the very large one there next to, next to Denny's. Um, the 1700 block of North Walnut. So those are contributions through the Unified Development Ordinance that uh, are negotiated by the, by the provision of incentives. So that contribution from um, the um, uh, developer was was over, uh, I believe, 1.6 million dollars. So that enhanced the balance of the fund just this year. So that would be the main main source of revenue that uh, you're seeing in the budget book. So is that? Looking at next year's budget, though, I mean, has it not, has that not hit yet? Like, are we expected to collect that 1.6 million at, during the next year, and that's why it's appearing as a 2.1 million for the housing development fund for a calendar year, fiscal year 2023? I'm just struck by the really large jump in in that. Uh, not that I'm not supportive of it or something. I'm just trying to sure. understand it yeah. uh, more clearly. You know what the difference from year to year uh, mm -hmm. is in, in the what is sourcing that fund, what is contributing yep. to that fund. So that up until we got that payment in. Uh, late June, maybe early July. And so that the cash balance of the fund was um, I think around $400,000. So we are uh, keeping, wanting to keep a balance of the fund. So if you look at the, the total fund balance right now is $2.6 million, okay? So what we're asking to do is keep sort of a half a million dollars back for the rest of the year to fund projects. There's a project in the pipeline right now that we I uh, think we want to fund out of the housing development fund. So for instance, so we've got half a million dollars to last through the rest of 2022. So out of that 2.6, we're going to ask, we're, we are holding 500,000 uh, back that we may come back to you at the end of the year and ask for an appropriation for. But then we want to appropriate forward 2.1 million for next year. And that's all money we have okay. uh, that we just are uh, wanting to move forward into next year, if that helps. Yeah, thank you. The current balance helps synthesize that for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with that, I think everybody asked a question. We can move on to second round. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Of course, you and I recently have talked about the Quiet Nights Ordinance. We do have one, Play It Loud and Draw a Crowd. Um, it is August, and we have new neighbors. Um, my question has to do with your relationship to how those things get reported and what your compliance officers, what, what how they can respond to that. And for instance, if somebody is cited for being a, a nuisance, you know, they're de definitely violating that ordinance, who do you go back and talk to? Is it the landlord or is it the people on the lease? If, if this nuisance house, as it were, is a rental property, mm -hmm. can you just kind of talk a little bit about what hands responsibility is in addressing those kinds of nuisance properties? Yeah. Well, the noise ordinance would go go through BPD. We don't necessarily get a record of, of those folks. Um, I do think there's a relationship, and we have learned a little more. I've learned a little more this week, Councilmember Sandberg, from some of the issues that we talked about over the weekend. Um, and Angela Van Roy and our neighborhood services program has done some work already with the uh, impacted neighborhood. Uh, and so the IU Student Affairs um, has a role there uh, that they're active in. Um, as far as Title VI goes, so we sort of, let me just take you through how I responded to that this weekend, if that, that's helpful. Maybe it's helpful to council members. So we had a, a report of a large party in one of our neighborhoods over the weekend, and the, um, uh, I got contacted from uh, someone I know in that neighborhood. Uh, the listserv, council member Sandberg sent a, an email that had been going on in the listserv, and so I told the person I know that lives there, they said, hey, can Han do something about this? I said, well, here's, you know, the noise ordinance is, you know, uh, the P Bloomington Police Department is the chief respondent there. Our role comes in in two ways. It's hard for us to be there in real time, so we can't go and break up a party in hand. That's not under Title VI. Um, so 
the Title VI role comes in, and we asked one of our uh, neighbor compliance officers to go out and check out the property. I will tell you that they reported back today that there was no violation that they could see. Um, we also, I also encourage that person to uh, try to engage the neighborhood association to try to have some um, community efforts made there. So the person living next door, people living down the street, how that party impacted the neighborhood. And so I think those neighbors, Angela has been working to uh, work with the neighborhood to uh, have those conversations. And we've offered to do our, our door hangers. Uh, you know, there are noise ordinance door hangers that can be distributed so we can provide those to the neighborhood. Um, as far as the rental side goes, the Title 16, the um, lease agreement would, would have a role there. And so on, on uh, trash and things like that, it's, uh, you know, it is the resident's responsibility, but there are certain things that are governed by the lease that we, we talk to and hear from landlords about who would be responsible for a citation uh, in that case. So we do have that communicate. We get emails frequently that here's the lease agreement, tells you a little bit more about this relationship and whose responsibility it is. So it's not the same everywhere. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, one more follow-up. You've requested a new position program manager. That's right. Um, uh, first thing, uh, can you tell us, and I know it's not exact, and I know it's not been approved, and I don't, I don't know a bunch of stuff, but what do you anticipate the salary range to be for that position? And can you talk to us a little bit about uh, it, its affordable housing focus? What do you, is your vision of this position doing, and mm -hmm. how, how is it going to... Um, help. Sure. Uh, that position, I believe, was approved for a grade seven, so it would be within the grade seven range. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but that's the job grade it would be. <laughs> so I can get that to you. <laughs> but, uh, um, and so that person's role would be, as, as we are uh, looking at the revenue that we have in the department, as we've got all the focus in the three buckets on affordable housing, um, how are we managing those projects? How are we pushing things forward? Uh, project management is a big focus of the department because that's how we just get things done. If we uh, have a housing project coming in that requires attention through the housing development fund, how can we be more intentional with that money, go out and find projects, uh, not just be responding, but how do we go out and find those? How do we work with uh, organizations that are existing in town? Maybe they want to expand. How do we help them do that? And so added capacity is needed for that. Right now, that, those responsibilities largely uh, fall on uh, myself and our assistant director, uh, Brent Pierce. And so we want to make sure we've got somebody every single day focused on that project management. We provide the direction, and we're doing a lot of administrative stuff as well, but we really need that project management focus and that program management focus, which is really key when you're managing money. We have our federal program managers that is, uh, there are a lot of rules around uh, federal uh, dollars, as there are local, but we really need that project management focus, and that's what they would be focused on. In addition, I want a little more activity on outreach and education on what the programs that we do have. HAND has, a, as you all know, has a ton of programs, and I'd really like to put a larger focus on getting those programs out. Hey, did you know we have this money for down payment assistance? Did you know about our home buyers club? There's more outreach we can do, and so I'd like to uh, put more focus on that as well. And your assistant director will still be involved in that process. Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a lot of work to go around, as you know, and so we're we have we both would, um, but uh, our, our our assistant director has um, has supervision over the Title 16 program as well. So that's a big part of of his job is to oversee that, which is a big a big role. Thank you, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I've uh, been talking to a few residents who live uh, in cooperative housing the Bl through Bloomington, Bloomington Cooperative Living, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering what incentives we have to encourage this as an affordable housing opportunity, yeah. and have there been any uh, developments in that area in the past year? There have. So we've uh, provided community development block grant dollars to Bloomington Cooperative Housing. Uh, cooperative living, excuse me, and um, there are uh, the housing development fund is a place that uh, can be used uh, can go toward uh, organizations like Bloomington Cooperative Living for uh, expansion and help with developing units. Uh, we believe the cooperative housing is a 
a model. It's a successful model here in Bloomington, and so we want to see that grow. And so we're interested in, and are working with them on, on that. The Housing Development Fund is a resource for them as well. And is there any um, other uh, cooperative organization that maybe the city could encourage? Um, I know, I mean, the only one I really know about is Bloomington Cooperative Living. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there are some other groups maybe catering more to people that are older um, that we could encourage through uh, financial support from the city. Um, I'd be happy to talk to them. I don't know of any <laughs> that are officially uh, stood up as organizations as organizations yet. Um, I was on a conversation earlier this year with a group that was looking at doing a cooperative living environment, but I haven't heard much more there. But I'd be happy to talk to anybody that wants to talk about affordable housing. I'm not to sound, uh, you know, patronizing or anything like that, but like it's we, whatever the discussion, let's figure out how to, you know, what it, what it is and how we can help if there's a way to help. So I think we should have a conversation if you know of someone, but I don't know of any other official organization yet other than Bloomington Cooperative Living. And have along these same lines, have you um, encountered any uh, contradictions between um, uh, trying to encourage uh, co-ops as an affordable housing option and um, zoning not allowing larger um, houses or more than one house on a parcel? No, I haven't thus far. Because I know uh, that um, a friend of mine lives in, 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 uh, in Springfield, Oregon, and that they had to get special permission to have two houses on a parcel mm -hmm. that are a co-op. So yeah. I always wonder about the interplay there. Yeah, I haven't, uh, has it come to my so purview as a conflict, but uh, planning may be able to tell you more. All right, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Councilmember Scambolari. Oh, and then Councilmember Roland. Sorry, Councilmember Roland. You go first. All right, go ahead, Councilmember Roland. I did see your hand. I forgot on the Zoom screen. Thank you, um, Mr. Zodi. So, uh, in the conversation about affordable housing units being built, I know that in the first year or two of the Hamilton administration, uh, that was done through creative uh, tax abatements and PUDs. Um, and uh, I wonder now. How are the bulk of affordable housing units being uh, created? Through what mechanism? Is the city demanding it? Is it part of the zoning code? Is it, are, there, are people coming voluntarily to offer affordable housing? How is that working? Sure. I would say uh, yeah, that obviously predates me, but uh, I think the, the new uh, provisions in the Unified Development Ordinance, or UDO, uh, are helping streamline that, making a, a uh, more obvious, clearer path toward how one might uh, create affordability through the incentives that are offered there. We still, uh, so that's the first part. I have a three-part answer. The first part is that. The second part is uh, what incentives we can use through uh, things like the Housing Development Fund, uh, through our home dollars, which we are uh, trying to uh, be more intentional about how we spend those. Those are very complicated dollars, home dollars, the federal money from HUD. Um, so it's the incentives that we have and how can we boost those. The third part of that is what are we doing proactively? And I would say with Hopewell and the properties uh, on North Arlington, or Arlington Park Drive, excuse me, um, those are positions where the city owns the property. Um, we are working, as Ms. Gazunas mentioned, working with the uh, Summit Hill Community Development Corporation on the creation of a land trust. And so when we are in a position to um, uh, own the property and, and help uh, advance its development, I think that creates a third avenue for the uh, for driving uh, forward affordability uh, here in the city. I can't see the timer, so someone will give me a heads up. Uh, but um, so of the 227 units that were created last year, can you roughly break down how they were, uh, how they came to be? I would have to uh, go through them and tell you. Uh, Council Member Vol on each of those that had affordability would have an agreement in place. Um, some of those would have been done prior to the UDO being adopted, so I would have to get back to you on that, which I'm happy to do. Well, they say retreated switchyard, brownstone terrace, 300 East Sillside. Those are, I think, were all after the UDO. Yeah, the retreated switchyard was a, uh, received a tax abatement. We also, uh, for all intents and purposes, granted the land there. That was a low-income housing tax credit project, which I would maybe say is a fourth avenue. Okay. Those are rare, more rare, but low-income housing tax credit projects uh, like that one are also possible. 
I any others like I would have to get back to you. To be a column. I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, that might need to be a column. That might need to be a column added to the table that Comptroller Sandberg was looking for with the greater breakdown of how those units were like, uh, what was the origin of the affordable housing? Was it uh, triggered by which aspect of code? Final question is, are those home dollars renewable? Or are they a one-time uh, program? I don't know much about the home program. Council Member Volan, you were actually already at your time uh, prior to that question. Okay, then I'll stop there. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Council Member Scambellari. Yes, thank you. Uh, you mentioned several different sources of potential affordable housing projects. W might it be a rehab, might it be a new construction and so forth, or a, blanks, or a blank canvas. Um, with that in mind, can you share an update on the Trinitas project on West 17th, please? I'd be glad to. Thank you for the question. Um, so the, uh, to give quick background on the project, the, there's a large rental development uh, which is being built uh, nearing completion which is uh, more than 300 rental units being developed by Trinitas Ventures. Uh, as a part of that uh, PUD, uh, they are granting, deeding over 45 lots to the city of Bloomington to, and will make them development ready. So they're building out the street, uh, the uh, sewer connections, all of that to have them ready. So the city has uh, issued an RFP earlier, RFI, excuse me, earlier this year. Uh, we received three responses back from that and we're in the decision process now. One of the things as I just mentioned uh, with the um, creation of the land trust is we're talking about Summit Hill for possible partnerships up there and how we can make at least half of that development permanently affordable. Not all of it necessarily, but at least half to get permanent affordability in that part of, uh, in, in that development. That's R4 zoning, so uh, there's uh, the ability to put uh, more than one unit on the lot. And so we're looking at all those things right now and going through the process of what it would take to uh, transfer property to a developer, transfer it to uh, the land trust, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, in decision mode on that, I would say council member. Mm -hmm. Water for you there. Oh, thank you. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and with the understanding that those variables are in play, can you ballpark the timetable? For We'd like to get a, uh, an agreement in place by the end of the year. So Calendar uh, year. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. House Member Rosenberger. Thank you. This isn't in the budget because uh, we're not allowed to regulate, but it's something I w would love to talk about a little bit, Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. um, I know the state doesn't allow this, but I, I just feel like we're having a pretty big problem with full-time Airbnbs, especially in our walkable neighborhoods. And I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do to discourage that, encourage other types of rentals. Um, I know I've talked a little bit about potentially doing like a volunteer um, rental certification for Airbnbs and like, I don't know. I feel like if maybe we were to market that, at least we could make sure these homes are like safe for visitors because it also just bothers me that there's no way to make sure guests in these homes have any kind of protections like smoke detectors, you know, um, thoughts on that? Uh, well, um, it's a discussion that comes up uh, from time to time. We don't regulate uh, short-term rentals in any way here in Bloomington. State law has sort of a statutory provision that anything under 30 days is considered short term. So if you're registering a rental um, and you're leasing for any more than uh, 30 days, then it's, it's, uh, it, it is subject to Title 16. So state law has a role there. Um, what I do tell people when they come in and ask about this, I remind them of some of the other things that any property owner in Bloomington is subject to, to, to which first being our, our Title VI uh, ordinance. So if you're a property owner in Bloomington, if your guests are there for a weekend and you know there's a Title VI violation, then you know, you're obviously subject to that. Also historic preservation guidelines, if the property is uh, of a historic nature or in a historic neighborhood, it's important to keep those things in mind if you're purchasing the property. So I had a conversation with a realtor earlier this year who said, what do they need to know? Do you do this? I said, no, we don't regulate them, but know these things. Going back to one of your other questions, I would say if we did engage in the reg regulation of those, I think we would uh, need a lot of enhanced capacity to do that because it's, it's a complete departure from the rental inspection program and the cycles and all that stuff. It would be a, a pretty big systematic change or another uh, system to monitor. So I would 
we have a big conversation there. And I understand the conversations had been had some previously in the city, but not recently. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any additional second round questions from council members? Not seeing any. Uh, let's maybe go to the public now and we can come back for third round questions if council members have them. But uh, is anyone in chambers interested in commenting on the uh, housing and neighborhood development budget? Or if anyone online would like to comment, please raise your hand in Zoom or message the meeting host via chat that you would like to unmute and, and make a comment. Deputy Attorney Kulak, do we have any commenters? I don't see any hand raised on Zoom right now. Okay. Still nothing? Still nothing, and if you're on a phone dialing in, you'll have to hit star nine. Let us know if anything comes through, but seeing none, we can return to the council for any third round questions uh, at this point. Seeing none, uh, any final comments or debate from council members? May I? Yes, uh, Mr. Zodi. <laughs> uh, should I respond back to Councilmember Volan's question or just do that in writing? I want to make sure I'm closing the loop there on his question. So I will do whatever the will of the council, but I don't want to leave that unchecked. I would defer to Councilmember Volan as, as that could be a third round if he would like. Uh, I'm, I've, the questions I want to ask are stacking up, so which questions uh, <laughs> were you referring to, Mr. Zodi? Uh, I think the one on housing units and home dollars were the two that I noted. Right, yeah. Uh, if, well, if the, ho the home dollars is the question you wanted to follow up on, I'm all ears. Okay, home dollars are allocated to the city every year as part of our uh, entitlement uh, status as 50,000 or more people, just like uh, community development block grant dollars. So this year we are projected to get $583,000 in home. That's an allocation that comes every year uh, to, to the city, um, and so that uh, that is for building housing. It's for yeah for for the construction of affordable housing, and and uh, uh, we also that's our, our down payment assistance programs that are funded federally are also through the home program, and we have our rehab programs are are largely funded out of there. Okay, the other questions I can follow up on uh, in writing because they're sort of more basic questions, but I will ask. Um, why haven't we pursued um, a housing trust before now? I mean, wouldn't it make sense to the administration to lock in their affordable housing gains in a permanent way through ensuring that, like, if they're all owned by, I don't know, I, I'm uh, sort of, it seems like a housing trust should already exist. It's a good idea. The land trust, you mean, council member? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a land trust uh, some time ago in Bloomington, and I think a priority of the administration and the housing authority through their development arm was to create the uh, land trust through Summit Hill. So that's been a priority over the, at least the last 18 months, if not before, and I would say before. That's just since I've been here, and it's been priority for the mayor. Is, is there a particular hang-up that would keep it from already existing? Like, why isn't that, why, is that so hard? Uh, not having uh, done what I can't say to the level of difficulty, but there is a financing that's important there. So the, the trust is uh, owning the property, the uh, homeowners, if that's the model, are owning the structure. So the financing that's in place and the financial model is very important to be uh, um, financially sound. And so that's a really important effort. If you're going to engage in that, as you know, you've got to make sure it's sound. And so we're trying to create opportunities for how we could we could build the land trust up potentially through so the it's not like a like sycamore land trust where uh they're just preserving land to be not developed they're uh, uh this is about managing the housing in perpetuity that's correct that the idea that's correct and got it and what that model so i'll follow up like. with other questions in writing yeah yeah thank you so much yeah that's the difference thank you okay thank you mr zardi last call for any final comments uh council member sandberg Thank you. 
Um, I, I had a few more questions that I'll just submit in writing. They did not rise to the occasion tonight. Um, I, I think I will pass on this tonight. I know it was mentioned in one of the earlier presentations that you know, hand staff is pretty self-sufficient and you've got all kinds of efficiencies, but it just appears to me that uh, with all the additional rental units and, and, and responsibilities that the hand department has, um, I don't know if what, how those efficiencies are, are being you know, factored in it, but it appears that inspections do require a lot of face-to-face, -face, and that takes a lot of time. So uh, I want to just take a little more time to examine all the information. You've, you've presented us with a lot, much appreciated, and uh, I, I certainly appreciate the work of you and your staff and uh, all the different moving parts that you have to manage. Thank you. Thank you. Other final comments? I will briefly uh, just think, thanks again, Mr. Oh, Councilmember Rowland, I'll go to you first. Go ahead. I don't have, you don't have to go last, but okay. Um, uh, I uh, want to echo uh, Councilmember Sandberg's uh, comments about housing. Uh, I do, I, I have never understood why, uh, I mean, in years past, I would ask uh, the Van Han director, uh, listen, we could, you know, in, in District 6 alone, half of uh, your inspector, your inspector, we take up half of your inspectors because there's so many rentals in District 6. Um, I know that hand inspectors have gotten more efficient over the years and that's fantastic, but I've never understood why if council members are asking them to, to, to give them another inspector, why they don't uh, take it. The, the things that could, I mean, it's, I think it reflects a general um, opinion of the of my several colleagues uh, that um, you know rental housing being two thirds of the housing stock in the city means we have a lot more uh, concerns about quality of life that could perhaps be enforced by the uh, hand department. So uh, it, it's never really been clear to me why they couldn't use more staff or, or what they could do with more staff. Uh, I'm glad they're trying to be efficient. Um, uh, but uh, I will be looking forward to getting the data um, that we've talked about, just sort of definitive, how much housing is there in the city, how much was the rental, uh, because we don't have a way of tracking it now. Um, and it's uh, another way of responding to the mistake that was the 2020 census. If we can show that the housing units and the city have increased substantially, it won't make any sense to anybody that there's been no increase in population. Uh, so that's certainly a motive behind some of my questions. Finally, I'd just like to put in a word for Angela Van Roy's work uh, in, and her neighboring project trying to uh, actively address the idea, how do we make uh, students into neighbors? Uh, I think it's got a lot of potential and I want um, to, to encourage everyone to get behind uh, that effort. Um, so, you know, with all that, uh, thank you for the presentation. I have just a brief couple of comments. Uh, first is just a request to please, please be sure to use consistent terminology uh, in describing especially technical things like, like funds. Um, as council members, we're often left sort of uh, jumping around the budget book to try to look at things systematically because the information is located in a lot of different places. And uh, I think we still have a lot of improvement as a city uh, on, on that front to provide the information council members ask for in a systematic way that is uh, helpful for us digesting the information. So I know uh, from hearing from my colleagues, we, we are searching around the budget book and a control find that isn't reliable to identify the same information is, is uh, frustrating on, on that front. So please uh, be extra careful in the future to uh, use consistent terminology. Um, second is just that I'm gonna vote no tonight because I'm still digging into some details here. I noted on the first night of the budget hearings that I don't generally abstain from votes, but to, to me, if, if I still have questions, I'm a no until it's a yes. And so I just wanted to explain that for my vote tonight. Um, and if there are no other comments, I would entertain a do pass uh, motion. So moved. So moved. And second. Okay, we have a <laughs> uh, motion, a motion and a second uh, for, the, for the council to recommend do pass on the um, housing and neighborhood development budget. Would the deputy clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Volan. Pass. Sims. Pass. 
Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Pass. Rallo? Pass. Flaherty? No. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Pass. Thank you. I believe that is a 3 1 5 vote. Three yeses, one no, five abstentions. And with that, we will move on to the Economic and Sustainable Development Department budget. And we have Mr. Carley joining us this evening to present that department's budget. Good evening, Mr. Carley. Please go ahead. There you go. Okay. Good evening, council members. I'm Alex Crowley, Director of Economic and Sustainable Development, or ESD. It's my pleasure to present ESD's 2023 budget request for your consideration. Thank you to the mayor's office and the controller team for their help preparing the budget. This evening, I will highlight some recent ESD accomplishments, goals for 2023, and summarize significant changes in our proposed 2023 budget. The department's mission is to cultivate a resilient community built on shared prosperity, inclusive economic opportunity, environmental stewardship, and a thriving arts and culture ecosystem. In other words, we work to enhance the quality of life for all residents in Bloomington with a particular emphasis on underserved populations. To accomplish our goals, our small team depends upon many partners inside and outside the city. We appreciate those collaborations. As you know, ESD leverages a number of funding sources to accomplish its goals, including those listed here. The 2023 funding request you'll see this evening includes the first three funds, the General Fund, ED-LIT, and ARPA. There are eight full-time employees in ESD. My colleagues include six highly capable, motivated, and talented individuals, each with their distinct roles to support the city's priorities. They are pictured here, and in fact, some are in the room. It's my distinct honor to serve alongside these dedicated public servants. We currently have one vacancy in the position of Assistant Director for Small Business Development. We expect to fill that position by the end of September. In addition, we're pleased to re regularly host fellows and interns in the department. We appreciate the Council's support in augmenting ESD staff over the past several years, including the positions of TDM Manager and Sustainability Coordinator to help the department keep pace with the city's increased sustainability work. ESD's areas of concentration are sustainability, including economic, environmental, and social sustainability, support for arts and culture, entrepreneurship and small business support, as well as more extensive economic development projects. Before I get into the details of our 2022 accomplishments and our proposed 2023 budgets, I'd like to frame the moment in time and how it informs ESD's current work and our goals in 2023. First, we continue to benefit from a federal administration substantially better aligned with our priorities than the previous federal administration was. ESD uh, intends to continue to successfully pursue and secure federal funding this year and next. We also appreciate the Council's support of the ED-LIT, which as, a, you will, as you'll see in my presentation later on, will allow us to take significant strides to implement the Climate Action Plan, among other priorities. Despite these opportunities, however, we continue to face significant headwinds that are hurting a lot of our people and holding our community back. These challenges include the lingering effects of the COVID pandemic, which manifests themselves in ongoing health concerns, general uncertainty about the future, and continuing staffing, supply chain, and material cost impacts. The climate crisis is affecting all aspects of our lives, particularly devastating those those of us at lower income levels least able to absorb climate impacts. As the mayor said on Monday, we're pleased that the 2023 budget proposes transformative investments in the Climate Action Plan and public uh, transit, thereby helping us all build a sustainable and equitable economy. Inflationary pressures are also significant and real, impacting people and businesses and causing hardships across the community. And to add to all of this, we find ourselves at odds as a community with some actions from the Indiana legislature, including the unconscionable SB1 law uh, taking effect in September. In sum, we face a challenging present and an uncertain future, 
but we feel we're well positioned to navigate through the critically important years and decades ahead. Let me now turn to some recent ESD accomplishments. I'll start with our work to support uh, Bloomington's arts and culture. And as with all of these highlights, the two mentioned here are only a small sample of the totality of ESD's works, work in this regard. As you may recall, late in 2020, the city unexpectedly reacquired the John, Al John Waldron Arts Center from Ivy Tech. Mayor Hamilton convened a task force to lead public engagement on the future of the facility. ESD became heavily involved in transitioning the Waldron, including implementing a significant deferred maintenance program to prepare the building for reopening in January 2022, which we accomplished, and successfully negotiating an agreement with Constellation Stage and Screen to assume management responsibilities of this important arts facility for the foreseeable future. We're pleased that Constellation has assumed responsibility for the building starting July 1 of this year, and we look forward to their success. And we appreciate the strong collaboration with legal and with the Department of Public Work on this project. ESD has continued its support of festivals and other community cultural events, including the, uh, supporting the IU Arts and Humanities Council's terrific Grand Falloon Festival in May and June of this year, which culminated in a final concert on Kirkwood featuring, featuring nationally recognized musical acts. Maybe we'll get Beyonce next year. These types of events uh, provide a chance for all of us in the community to gather again after so much isolation during the pandemic. In the area of sustainability, with the Sustainability Action Plan and Climate Action Plan as our guides, some recent highlights include, ESD has been hard at work developing a climate engagement tool to help our communities, residents, and organizations understand individual actions they can take to help the climate of emergency help address, I'm sorry, the climate emergency. The tool will also consolidate information about the city's myriad sustainability programs into an easily accessible online resource. Excuse me. <clears throat> we are calling the platform Zero in Bloomington, and it will launch in September. Another important effort is the city's transportation demand management program, which is set for launch to the public next week. As you know from recent uh, report to council, the platform is built, and engagement with employers and organizations across the community is already underway. We've been gratified that Bloomington's climate and sustainability work has garnered national and regional attention, including Lead for Cities designation from the U.S. Green Building Council and Soul Smart Gold designation, which we just received in July. In the area of business relations and development and with council's substantial support, ESD continues to focus on making Bloomington a great place to work and build a career. ESD led the process to facilitate Catalan's commitment to invest $350 million in capital and grow its local workforce by 1,000 high paying jobs and we're pleased that the investment is now underway. With Public Works, we've continued to provide local businesses with outdoor infrastructure to help stimulate ongoing commercial activity as the pandemic has waxed and waned during the course of the year. And all the while, we've continued to help with various workforce programs, including those involving entrepreneurship and workforce reentry with partners such as The Mill and Centerstone and others. Finally, ESD has helped lead or been integral to some important long-term economic development projects. These include working to reactivate interest in the Trades District, the city's innovation district, because the emphasis in the Trades District has been to develop office space and the office market bottomed out during the pandemic, we've had to restart our efforts. I'm pleased to say we're beginning to see signs of a reactivating office market. In the Trades District, ESD is also collaborating on implementation of the city's $3.5 million Economic Development Administration grant to fund a Trades District Technology Center. A number of challenges remain with that project, which ESD is currently helping to overcome. And we're deeply immersed in preparations for the redevelopment of the current 24-acre Hopewell site, a once-in-a-century project that will create significant housing and other opportunities in Bloomington for decades to come. Through these projects, ESD is focused on long-term goals while also addressing day-to-day -day challenges the community continues to face. And it bears saying that while we're constantly striving to improve the community, we should recognize that Bloomington is truly a great small city, punching well above its weight class and quality of life amenities, whether our art scene, our cultural assets, our parks, sustainability work, our jobs, and so many other qualities. We should not forget that fact. 
Turning now to some example 2023 goals, starting with arts and culture support, Bloomington's rich landscape of cultural assets has only now begun to emerge from the extreme pressure they have felt in the past several years. ESD proposes to continue efforts to buttress these many individual artists and organizations directly and indirectly. Specifically, our focus will be to help connect artists and groups with available funding and other mutual support resources through a community arts platform. Significant engagement by ESD with local artists and organizations over the past year have suggested this would be an important addition to our community's arts resources. We also hope, with your budget approval, to continue to focus resources on emerging artists of our community to help them build their capacities long into the future. Specifically, we will seek to increase grants to artists early in their career, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community from 5% to 25% of total arts grants next year all of which will be guided by an arts feasibility study which ESD has led since last year to help direct Bloomington's arts and culture efforts for the next decade. We expect to release the findings of that study well before the end of 2022. Our focus on sustainability with particular emphasis on the risks of climate change to our most vulnerable populations is now further supported by the significant additional funding from ED Lit. Thank you for that support. Our 2022 Three budget goals include expanding programs to help residents and organizations overcome energy burdens with an emphasis on improving energy efficiency and adopting renewable energy. As you know from the city's greenhouse gas inventory, energy in the built environment continues to be the greatest area of opportunity to help address our climate challenges. The waste stream, particularly the commercial waste stream, has long been an area for improvement. With this in mind, we'll be focusing some efforts towards, the business, towards businesses and multifamily complexes to encourage composting, among other ways, to mitigate waste. And we will continue our efforts to support our local, sustainably produced food businesses, including growers and local food artisans through technical assistance, among other efforts. I should note, what you see represented in ESD's budget only scratches the surface of the sustainability investments the city makes across its operations in the community. We look forward to providing you a thorough review of city investments and actions during our sustainability and climate action plan update presentation currently scheduled for October. As you know, transportation demand management is an initiative to reduce single occupancy vehicle travel. While we consider it a sustainability effort, as recognized in the climate action plan, I wanted to call out TDM as a significant effort in its own right in 2023. We have set certain specific goals related to our Go Bloomington TDM efforts. First, we understand that the long-term viability of the program will require us to secure significant funding from external sources to help us achieve our long-term objectives. We will be seeking no less than a one-for-one -one match of our local funding from federal sources in 20, for 2024. Simply launching Go Bloomington as a platform is not enough. We'll be driving registrations and engagement on the platform in 2023 to encourage residents and commuters to switch their modes of travel from driving alone to another more sustainable option. And as we discussed in our recent TDM presentation to Council, we'll be developing and tracking impact metrics for the program to help guide future investments. COVID has shown a light on the frailty of our local small and mid-sized business ecosystem. With your help, which the community very much appreciates, We've been nimble and responsive over the past several years to address some of that weakness, but significant work remains to be done. We've previously provided financial and organizational support for programs focused on entrepreneurship, job training, and re-entry to the workforce, and intend to continue that work in 2023. We're also, we also recognize the competing perspectives regarding outdoor commerce, especially around Kirkwood and the court, Courthouse Square, in 2023 to provide some amount of predictability to the community we will undertake the complicated work of establishing five-year parameters around potential ongoing closures, an effort that has been necessarily ad hoc due to the uncertainty of the past several years. And as noted earlier, we see significant opportunities to partner our sustainability and small business efforts to help commercial interests in town make a positive impact on our overall climate posture. ESD will implement initiatives to support small businesses who are eager to improve their operations and adopt better sustainability practices. And finally, we'll continue our work on major economic development programs and investments to position Bloomington for economic vibrancy in the next decades. 
We'll be focusing on design excellence in the built environment, particularly from private development. Recent development trends have yielded outcomes that are, to put it delicately, not the most inspired buildings. Working closely with Columbus, Indiana, and other design resources, we will be seeking creative ways to overcome this unfortunate recent trend. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be redoubling our efforts to activate the Trades District, and in particular, to initiate construction of the potential Trades District Technology Center. And finally, as the Hopewell Project accelerates, we anticipate significant ESD resources allocated to support that substantial redevelopment effort, including its sustainability strategies. Through these efforts and others, our work will be focused on expanding housing and workforce opportunities, continuing the strong wage growth we've seen in Bloomington over the past several years, which I know can be stressful for certain organizations, and help improve the built environment as we experience uh, it every day. Turning now to the budget dollars for 2023, our 2023 budget request across the general fund, ED-LIT, and ARPA funds totals $7.26 million, representing an increase of $4.56 million, or 169% over 2022. This is admittedly an eye-popping increase for a department our size, so let me break it down for you. In category one, which is personnel costs, the 2023 request is approximately $767,000, an increase of about $110,000, or 16.8% from 2022. This breaks down as follows. 49,400 represents the addition of the sustainability coordinator. 32,600 results from the cost of living and one-time 2023 salary increases. And 28,400 is from increases in employee benefit costs. In category two, which is for supplies, we have a 2023 request of $8,400, an increase of $500, or 6.3% over last year, to help us shore up supplies for community arts projects. Category three is where we have the majority of our budget. ESD's category three request is $6.48 million, an increase of $4.45 million, or 219% over 2022. I've broken category three out by fund so you can see what's driving the change. In the general fund, we request an increase of $8,381, or 1.8% from 2022. This allows us to add an arts communication and resource platform offset by other reductions. Our ED-LIT request is a net increase of $5.68 million, which is of which $3.81 million is targeted for Bloomington Transit, which means ESD will functionally administer an increase of $1.87 million in 2023. Our ARPA request decreases by $1.2 million, or 78.8% from 2022, and ESD does not have capital, uh, category four capital requests. Because the, e, uh, the ED lid is unique for budgeting in 2023, let me spend a little extra time on ESD's administered allocation of $1.87 million, which adds transformational funding for climate action plan implementation totaling $1.63 million, $200,000 for workforce and economic development support, and $46,500 for continuing uh, public arts and arts development support. These amounts align with the council's broad ED-LIT approval. And as the mayor mentioned in his opening remarks, on a per capita basis, the combined ESD-administered ED-LIT and BT amounts, $5.68 million together, adds another $650 per capita to the $1,100 per capita national investment in sustainability. Our local investment is pretty remarkable at two-thirds of the federal per capita amount. Focusing on the Climate Action Plan implementation funding, you'll see here that for energy in the built environment and transportation, uh, those two categories reflect the majority of the Climate Action Plan implementation support, with important, if smaller, amounts allocated to pr proposed waste mitigation, climate economy, and ecosystem and green space projects. Incidentally, the transportation category includes $250,000 in electrification funding of city fleet and equipment, which will help us migrate city operations away from two-stroke engines. ESD has more granular information on these categories, as well as the workforce and arts lines, which I can share with you separately. Turning to the 2023 ARPA, or Recover Forward request, which decreased by $1.2 million from 2022, we've recommended items listed here that are either one-time or finite in nature. 
Included, for example, is funding to support a significant project to onboard operations and maintenance responsibilities for the city's solar arrays. The total ARPA request is $334,500. To recap, here are the 2023 ESD budget requests by fund and in total, $1.24 million from the general fund, $5.68 million from EV Lit, of which $3.81 million will be for Bloomington Transit, $334,500 from ARPA for a total of $7.26 million. Thank you again for your time this evening. As I outlined at the start of the presentation, the department's mission is to cultivate a resilient community on, built on shared prosperity, inclusive economic opportunity, environmental stewardship, and a thriving arts and culture ecosystem. We believe our 2023 budget request will help us continue to successfully pursue that mission and to help the community emerge from the pandemic stronger than before. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Crowley and ESD staff for the presentation and your work. Uh, Councilman Morello, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Flaherty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Crowley, for your presentation. Um, so could you expound on what is meant by climate economy? Uh, yeah, so we have money set aside in there that are uh, one of the challenges in, in, uh, in the work that we do is that we can very easily affect um, our own operations, right? We, if we have the funding for it, we can actually impact it. Uh, but, but our operations only really um, uh, represents about 10% you know, of the total emissions. Um, and, and so relatively speaking, it's a small amount. And really what we need is the, is the overall economy, private sector and other organizations in the community to align with the goals of the, of the city and to start to also lead the way as they have in other communities to help the community advance as a whole. So monies are set aside in the, e, in the ED lit to help seed some of that work in 2023. In other words, to figure out ways in which we can actually uh, you know, uh, incentivize and, and, and encourage private sector and other functions in the economy to um, more aggressively help us on the sustainability front. Um, okay. Um, I'm a little unclear about that still, but let's move on to uh, add a second question. The mayor in his introductory remarks about the budget mentioned um, a commitment to the local food economy, something we've talked about quite a lot and something I've been favorable for a number of reasons. Uh, it's healthier, it supports local farmers, it supports farmland, it's good for the climate, et cetera. Um, what is the status of that? I don't see anything in the budget specific to that. Am I, have I missed? Well, there was, a, there was money as, uh, allocated through e, uh, EDLIT. Um, that money, uh, w w uh, in discussions with CFRD, ESD decided that money would be better administered, and you'll probably hear uh, Director oh. Gallagher Anderson talk about the ED lit allocation. So that so that's where that is. There is money in the general fund, the ESD general fund, to support uh, local food, but you won't see it pop on the um, on the ED lit detail in your budget. And yeah. could you just give us shortly what is the status or success of the farm stop? Well, my understanding is it's going along. It you know it had a. a Tough start, it, like everything every startup does. But my understanding is it's it's um, you know plowing ahead. I know that they um, had some staff turnovers early on, which I think sort of challenged them. Um, I have not gotten a report from them recently, uh, but I can send you the latest report that they sent out to us if you'd that like. That'd be helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, that's my time. So thanks. Yeah. Councilmember Scamillary, and then yes. Councilmember Sandberg. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the re for the report and the presentation tonight. Um, I, I have a questions along a couple lines, but I wanted to start with workforce development and economic development. Um, you talked about workforce reentry training, reskilling, upskilling, entrepreneurship, and so forth. Um, I'm interested in knowing which of those, in what are the outcomes of those investments? In other words, which have proved most promising in connecting people with new opportunities? Do we have data on that? What kind of data do we have? Yeah, I, I in fact, uh, uh, just recently received a, an update from the, the mill. The mill, the mill ad administers a lot of that, uh, that uh, those programming dollars. Um, and uh, 
maybe what I can do is follow up with you after the fact. I think generally speaking, it's been very successful, um, whether it's um, you know, the code school that they, that they work on in collaboration with Ivy Tech, um, or uh, some of these reboot, which is uh, kind of focused on reentry, a little bit more reentry. They're also targeting for 2023 some entrepreneurship for, you know, um, work at home mothers. So they're they're being very, uh, in, it's very interesting, and they're being very targeted to help interest groups that are uh, traditionally having more trouble getting into entrepreneurship, for example, as a as a career path. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as as you may know, the code. The code school, a code IT school, is about kind of if you're in one career and you want to evolve your career up into into coding, for example, that that's it's designed more for that kind of transition rather than someone who's out of the workforce and, and entering the workforce. So they have an interesting mix of programs. I think they're, you know, from our assessment, they're very successful. We're very pleased to to help support in our in our small way, and and we encourage that to continue in 2023. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. And I, I would find it helpful um, to have that specific information. How do, we, in other words, it, acknowledging that they are very different from each other, how do we measure their success, and what have we measured so far? Yeah. Um, so I would very much appreciate that data. Also, um, just in the time I have left, can you share an update on the COVID relief loans that were provided with ARPA funds to local businesses? What? What data, what are your impressions of, of the impact that those loans have had? Well, I mean, uh, I think we've gotten a lot of anecdotal evidence of, uh, of them being critically important. If you remember, those were put out at the time when there was going to be a gap between all hell breaking loose and the prospect of any kind of uh, PPP help. And really the idea was to try to sh just kind of carry people through that process, which, which, could, which did take a certain amount of time, and some people never got those. Um, but there were subsequent rounds, and so it was, help, it was a way to float those people through that uncertainty in the early on, especially. Um, people paid back their loans. We've had a certain amount, number of paying back. We've had, we're collecting, we're doing repayments. It's, they began in, in June, so we're starting to do sort of monthly you know, repayments. We're collecting that. Um, the, the downside is that there's still some businesses out there um, that are really struggling. And, you know, I, I had a conversation with, uh, with one business owner who actually sh showed me their, their uh, P&Ls for the last three years. And, and it was so stark to see that business, which was fine in 19, tank in 20 and 21, and still hasn't really come back to the level that it needs to be. So the, you know, when you look at the numbers and you look at the three, three, four, three years of P&Ls, uh, profit and loss statements, then you, you realize that like, y there's some businesses that are doing fine and they're gonna be fine. There's, and there's some businesses that still are not doing fine and, and, and it's no fault of their own. Um, you know, in this example, uh, the cost of goods sold was tripling for, that, for the product that they put out the staffing was costing them more, if they could even get it, um, and the revenues were down, right? So it's a perfect storm of negative effects on a business where you don't have the revenues, your staffing, if you can get it, is gonna be more expensive, and your costs are, are through the roof because of inflation. So that's the kind of business that's really suffering right now, um, and we're hoping to be, you know, um, to see that turn around maybe as, as students have come back, and it was, we're starting to see some some more spending power in the market. I'm going to follow up in writing with some additional mm -hmm. questions. So thanks. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. And first off, I do want to commend you and your staff for the heavy lifting that you did during that period. Mm -hmm. That was really awesome. We were all scared. We were all uncertain. And you really, I think, handled that gap with like, like, like troopers. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. My question has to do about the ARPA funding line that you have here, uh, because that is time limited, right? Is this the last year we're going to be able to spend ARPA money? I believe that um, I would have to ask uh, Jeff and Irwin, but, I, but I, or, um, I, I think that certainly from a city perspective, we are being encouraged. Oh, 20, I think it's uh, in, uh, end of 2025. Okay, so there still is a window. Uh, because my question specifically has to do with the $100,000 that you have in support for early childhood education. Looks like that is being transferred from the general fund over to this ARPA line that you're gonna be managing. Can you give some details about where that money goes and how that is helpful to the community? I mean, early childhood and childcare in general is such a huge, huge 
uh, issue for many working families. Yeah, it is absolutely. It's one of the, it's a it's a serious pain point for people trying to get back to work. Um, so that money has kind of been used in different ways in, in, the, in the handful of years that we've had it in the general fund. Uh, we've, we've done uh, grants as, you know, for a couple of years. We did uh, direct grants to providers to help them build capacity. So that was something that was done uh, early on. Um, I think we set some aside actually for, and we still have encumbered um, one year's worth for uh, Bloomington Housing Authority and a project that they have, I think, uh, uh, they started it back in 19, maybe or 20 or something like that. So there's, there's the amount that was kind of committed to that. We, um, this year, are looking at a proposal from um, the Community Foundation that, as you know, is a terrific resource regarding uh, early Smart childhood start. education. And they have, a, they have a program that they're trying to build, which is more of a kind of, if you think of it as a shared service uh, model for, um, for providers. So there's a lot of waste and inefficiency um, and, and in some cases, inability to fulfill on some of the challenges they have. So substitute teachers. If everybody out there is trying to solve their own substitute teacher problem, um, that's terribly inefficient. If everybody out there is, I'm, I'm not sure that this is one of those things, but if everybody out there is buying diapers uh, individually and they, they don't have buying power on that, you know, is there an opportunity to have uh, efficiencies that way? So I th my understanding of their program is they're trying to get a shared service uh, structure in place that people could take avail themselves as of especially the smaller um, um, providers and uh, so we're thinking that that's an appropriate use of, of the monies because then you can kind of spread it out into a uh, greater efficiency in the in the early childhood uh, marketplace perfect timing thank you mm -hmm. I meant my time additional questions from council members council member Piedmont Smith Yes, thank you, Mr. Crowley. Um, I wanted to ask a couple things that came up in your presentation. Um, the $28,000 increase in employee benefit costs, is that something we're seeing across the board, or is there something special for ESD employees that's new, that's raising I the I don't, can't speak to anybody else's budget. I just didn't analyze what was going on in my, I was like, why is that number going up so much? Um, it, it's, you know, as you know, as you may know, there are three or four different, it's not just health care, there's, whether, so I think some of it is actually attributable to the fact that we, when we had the sustainability coordinator join us, you know, or, or be proposed to join us, uh, that never made the budget. So, so that became an unbudgeted thing. So there could be some amount of that that's, that is uh, tied to a new position, unbudgeted new position that is continuing into 2023. Um, and then I think, as you learned early, uh, maybe on Monday, there are some new benefits being introduced, and I've seen in the details of my budget some uh, monies allocated to cover some of those new benefits. So some of that, I think, is, so it's not necessarily that costs are going up as much as the grouping of the lines that represent benefits cumulatively are going up year over year, uh, and I just wanted to call that out. Okay, thanks. Um, the other question I had was the uh, 3.81 million of the um, ED lit request that is for Bloomington Transit. Mm -hmm. Can you explain why that's part of your budget? How how that works? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> but I think it's I think it's uh, I think we're kind of a holding. It, I I believe what has to happen is it needs to be um, placed in a budget. It needs to be placed in the budget at the city. Um, there is a process that is going to uh, that is underway already for. I don't know if it's an interlocal, but a, but a set of agreements that would allow for us to then facilitate the, the spending of that money. Why my department was selected, I think, is maybe because we have sustainability funding, and um, but I, I'm not sure that it's. I mean, it's not. It's it's nothing specific about ESD that that makes it the you know the the. Uh, there's nothing about our work that is requiring us to be the department to issue it out. I think it just landed there for budgeting purposes. Um, so I don't know if um, Mr. Underwood is still on the line, but the, does that then get reappropriated by the Board of Public Transportation after it's moved from the city to BT? Yes, they accounted for it in their budget presentation. So it's, oh. it's essentially what Alex said. The money comes into the city and then we will grant that back out to BT. So we have to appropriate the funds so that we can then transfer them over to BT because they're a separate political body. 
and then they appropriate those. So um, John talked about that in his budget presentation last night. So as Alex said, we're currently working with um, legal and BT to uh, pull those grants uh, documents together. It'll be in our local, uh, probably a multi-year agreement uh, so they can apply for federal matching funds to go with that. And then it'll be subject to annual appropriation by you all. Okay, so we already saw it in BT's budget proposal. Correct. It was yeah. it was in there and it's in this, okay. Just yeah. trying to make sure we don't have duplicates here. It's passed. It, it, no, it's not a duplicate because this, we have to appropriate the money because it comes into us. Right. And in order to spend it, you all have to appropriate it, but then their board will also appropriate. And that's, that, that's the same with a lot of, of things that we do that are grants or interlocals where then there's an appropriate body that will also approve the expenditure once it comes through. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional council member questions at this time? Okay, with that we can go to the public for any comment. Uh, I see maybe one or two here in chambers who would like to comment. Please go ahead and come to the podium and state your name for the record. You will have two minutes uh, to comment. And a reminder to the folks on Zoom, you can also comment if you would like. Please use the raise your hand feature and Deputy Attorney Kulak will um, help, help you uh, be able to unmute and comment after our folks in the chambers do so. Uh, thanks. Um, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, four years ago, Economic and Sustainable Development came to this body and advocated for spending $12 million on a parking garage for the Trades District. This body was skeptical, but ESD made the hard sell, and they eventually prevailed. And now that money has been spent, and that garage has been built. God, I wish we could be that effective at building sidewalks. Anyways, I went and counted it on a random Wednesday a month ago at 3 p.m., and I found 28 cars. $12 million parking garage, enough space for 344 cars, and it's housing 28. I understand the mistakes are inevitable. Not every project's gonna be a success. I understand that the trades district may yet grow to fill that garage, but the garage has been open for more than a year already. We are already incurring routine maintenance and administrative costs in addition to servicing the bond, and there's simply no demand for it. ESD told this body that it would be paid for with user fees, but it's sitting empty. ESD was tasked with making the Trades District into a success. They had to figure out what Bloomington can do to set itself apart, and the biggest answer they came to, the one that's so important they asked for $12 million from the taxpayers, the thing that really set Bloomington apart from the competition, their answer, a parking garage. Ugh. This result was foreseeable. They ignored the planning and goal statements this body has passed. They didn't take advantage of expertise within the Planning and Transportation Department. It's no secret that parking garages are awful economic development tools. Any garage is inevitably a monument to unsustainability, and yet ESD went to the map for this massive investment in car commuting. This department has harmed this city. They made a big bet on parking, and we the people are now stuck with the bill. All that for only 28 cars. 28 cars, jeesh. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Yes, please go ahead. Evening, council members. My name is Joseph Winia. I am co-chair of the Commission on Sustainability, and I also chair the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District. I would like to express my gratitude to the city for the allocations that are designated to sustainability and climate action. Uh, in particular, I appreciate the follow-through on the action items specified in the adopted plans. And I strongly agree with the statement, uh, or the, with the strategy of, quote, focusing on high impact sustainability and climate strategies from the sustainability and climate action plans as stated in ESD's budget memo in the packet. I hope going forward that we can also bring a focus to energy, material, and waste reduction efforts, and that we can work towards an economic solution that does not depend on endless growth. Uh, I do appreciate the city's, city's ongoing efforts and will continue to do my personal best to help us progress towards a more sustainable community, planet, and, and, and planet as quickly and effectively as we are able. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Winia. Do we have any commenters on Zoom? At this time, no one has their hand raised. Um, if you are on Zoom, you have to go into your reactions button to find the hand raised button.
I'm sorry, Deputy Attorney Kulak, uh, did, did you say no one has their hand raised or one has their hand raised? I'm sorry, I said no one has no their one. hand No one, got raised. it. Yeah. <laughs> my, my apologies. Thank you. Well, it looks like we have no um, online commenters then for the ESD budget. Uh, with that, we'll return to the council members for any additional questions or comment. Uh, council Member Rosenberger. Thank you. I had a question about, um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I had a question about the, the lot that you are planning on selling in the trades district. Um, is that very general right now, or do you know exactly where that lot is? Well, we, we have a number of parties we're working with right now who are interested in different lots. Uh, so um, the short answer is that we know that they have a preference. We are not sure necessarily if that preference and if the overall strategy is going to align well or whether we can ease them into a different preference. Um, but, um, but the reference to the, to the sale of the lot in the uh, presentation is sort of a generic, right? It's, it's just to start to move the, the, the property. Okay, thank you. And I don't, I don't think this would happen, but um, it, it wouldn't be a parking garage, right? A parking garage? Right. I mean, it, I don't think anyone would be building another one when one is not really being used, but I just want to just no. asking that we won't have another parking garage. None of them that. is interested in that. And in fact, we're really trying to encourage people uh, who are interested in, uh, you know, developing in there to not have parking and leverage the parking that's available. And that it was built for that purpose, really, to, to attract and, and then consolidate parking uh, as opposed to have it distributed throughout the district. Got it. And just on that again is, I mean, it's zoned, I would assume, for, I don't know the zoning over there, but can it be mixed use? Can people live in yeah. that district? And in fact, that's part of the strategy that we're pursuing. Uh, nobody wants a corporate park that goes dead at night, right? So to, to make sure that doesn't happen, you want a good mix of, you, you, it does, you know, we have been very focused on office space because, and, and in particular attracting innovation and, um, and it's not sort of, the, as you know, the pandemic really, <laughs> as I said, kind of knocked the legs out from, from that market. Um, but we, so it does have a skew towards office space, but it does have uh, accommodations for not small amounts of, of housing, as well as, you know, active street level retail. So that, that's the vision for it, to kind of turn it into a, a very lively part of the city and a neighborhood. That's exciting. The last part of that, um, would you also then be encouraging a percentage of housing being affordable for those developments? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And one of the nice things, you know, that, that, uh, that applies also to Hopewell is, is when you actually own the land, you have much more control on the outcome than when you're just kind of hoping your zoning or whatever uh, incentives can try to guide an outcome. In this case, because the Redevelopment Commission owns the land, we have a tremendous amount of, of leverage on that. And, and yes, affordable housing, uh, as you may know, the, the, uh, the housing that's on the w uh, west side of, of Rogers is affordable housing. We would want to see workforce and affordable housing in the Trades District as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Yes. Um, I wanted to know uh, how much are the licensing fees for the electric scooter companies um, and how is this money spent? So the licensing, so there are two types of fees that they pay us. Uh, and to be clear, the, the, our department is the department that invoices and collects but does not retain um, the, the, the revenues. So the, um, the two fees are uh, the one-time application fee, sort of annual license fee, if you will, of $10,000 per company. And then there is a per-ride fee that is uh, essentially calculated every month at the end of the month retroactively to look at how many rides has, have occurred. They, those are self-reported, um, but we do have access to portals that, that we can look at. Um, and then that's uh, 15 cents per ride, uh, again, retroactive to the pre preceding month. So once a month, um, more recently, uh, although we had been doing it quarterly, we would consolidate the ride totals for the periods that we wanted to bill for, apply the 15 cents against them, issue the invoice. Monies come back in, and we turn that over to the controller's office. So those monies have exceeded $200,000 uh, to, to, you know, uh, through, the, through the period that we've been tracking it, which I think started in late 2018. 
there have been about 1.1 1 1 .1 million rides, I think, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in that, in that range. And, uh, and the 200,000 includes both the per ride and the, and the application uh, fees. Uh, and then the monies, I think, are, have been sitting there, and that, uh, that money, that funding is what um, Director Wason is, is uh, going to leverage as we um, want to start doing some of the changes that, that have been detailed, I think, in the mayor's memo or some, um, to try to help on, on some of the parking issues that we've seen out there. All right, so the, um, thank you, that's very interesting. So the money that comes in does not stay in your department, it goes to the controller and right. is used elsewhere. Yeah, well, so we track it into the payable process and then, and then we turn it over. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Gallo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crowley. I had an additional question about, and I can't remember the amount that's devoted to this, out of the 1.6 approximately million, that is uh, from the EDLIT revenue specific to the Climate Action Plan. Some is allocated for ecosystem and green space investments. What, what is that amount? And specifically, what will, what will, what is that, what will that be used for? So I, and again, I will, uh, happy to share uh, detail. Uh, so, you know, what I've given you is sort of category totals and underlying those are, are individual line items underneath that. But I can tell you for that particular, sorry, I'm just calling it up here. Um, so there's, there's 75,000 uh, for forestry, for, for uh, trees. And um, yeah, and I think that that is the total that was set aside in the ecosystem category. Okay, so that is, it's trees for the forestry for for what now? Yeah, it's essentially, I think the for program forestry. design is is really to help with uh, it, it is a collaboration with um, with um, Canopy, and to and to sort of augment some of the uh, urban forestry activities that are going on. Okay, why is it in your budget and not Parks and Rec? Um, we're doing a lot of, well, you know, we, uh, Parks Direct, I'm sure, has monies also set aside for that. Um, one of the things that came up in my discussion with uh, Councilman Piedmont Smith is, is, you know, for example, like our retiring of, of uh, as a city, of, of two stroke engines and city operations. Um, we will have portions of our budget sometimes uh, locked in to help augment efforts that are already happening in a department, right? So, for example, in that case, Parks Department, and they may talk to, to you about it has money set aside to do some amount of el electrification, we would augment it. This would be the same kind of scenario. Parks will certainly have money as associated with this, although um, you know, uh, Director McDevitt will have to speak to that. We have augmented monies. So that, that, that's what you'll see happening often in our, uh, our budgets, especially in regards to sustainability. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. I'd like to follow up a little bit on scooters. It is actually one of my biggest issues uh, at the moment, given a lot of constituent feedback that we're getting. Um, and, uh, thanks to your answer to Council uh, Person P uh, Piedmont's question, we are making quite a bit of money from the licensing from these companies. Um, but I think we also have an obligation to make sure that our sidewalks, particularly in our more congested areas in our downtown, are policed and properly enforced. And I'm just wondering, is it time to crack down a little bit on our regulations on how those are parked, where they are able to be parked? And I know we want point-to-point -point transit. It's part of the TDM. It's mm. part of our strategy to get people out of cars. But it's causing some problems, and I'm starting to feel pressure mm -hmm. uh, to tighten up the reins. Yeah. How, how can we do that? and help you know, make these scooter companies good citizens of our downtown because the, the sidewalks have got to be accessible to people who are walking, people who are, you know, have accessibility issues. So um, this is something I hear probably more frequently than almost anything in, in uh, Council Member Rollo and mine's constituent meetings. So <laughs> they're kind of coming after us to put uh, some pressure on you. So I, and not just you, I know it's other departments. But what is our strategy to make sure these scooter companies are good citizens of our downtown? Yeah, well, l let me start by saying I totally agree with you, right? Uh, I, I, there are three groups of people in my mind. There's the people who don't ride scooters. Um, there are the people who 
ride scooters and don't care where scooters are parked. And then there's the group in the middle, which I'm part of, which is I ride scooters, and I'm really annoyed when I see a parking a scooter that's parked in a, in a bad... It's like, why would you... Like, what's going on there, right? So I totally understand and totally agree with you that there are issues out there. Um, how widespread, I think, you know, may be open for debate, but they're certainly out there. I see them all the time. I walk the street. You know, if I see a scooter down, I'll just pick it up and put it aside. But it's sort of, it shouldn't be there to begin with, right? So, um, so I think we, anything's on the table as far as I'm concerned. And I think we need to be holding, uh, whether it's scooter companies or individual riders ac uh, accountable, uh, at, while at the same time, um, I think we should just tactically be, be fixing the problems before anybody, you know, before, they, be, before there are problems. So I think the initial step is really to address that latter thing, which is if you just have some people out there, and if, guess, you know, if it's going to be something that we need the scooter companies to pay for, then we should. Uh, but have people out there that are sort of t uh, performing triage on the problem, so the problem kind of isn't as widespread. Because part of the problem is... Um, and I'll go back to Council Member Flaherty's uh, anecdote from the other day, where you know we think of something like a parking corral as being the almighty solution, right? Um, he uh, described a solution, a situation where he actually had to go find one, but he did, and he parked at it, which he was supposed to do, and and came back. Well, I, you know, in speaking with the scooter companies, which I do re fairly regularly, they did, they have a different anecdote, which is that a student. We'll drive a, you know, I don't want to pick on students, but, you know, a student will drive a scooter up to the outside of the, of the classroom, um, and they will, uh, it will not be a parking corral, it will not be a bike rack, it will be an illegally parked scooter, and therefore cannot stop their, their ride, right? They can't actually turn it off, they can't stop accruing cost, so they don't, and they just leave it there, and the credit card gets charged, and they go to school, and whatever, right? So... So there is a level of behavior and kind of recklessness and sort of lack of, that, that I'm not applying to all students by any means, but, but there, there, is a, there is a, I think we all have an understanding, hopefully, that there is no magic bullet. We probably need to do two or three things. Corrals on their own, in their own will not help. Uh, cleanup on its own will not help. Um, behavior that is uh, punitive to riders uh, on its own will not help. Punitive behavior to the companies on its own won't help, but together, I think we actually, if we can apply them, uh, you know, as a group of, of actions, then I think we'll probably see some movement. Or may I add a fourth, and I know I'm at my time, mm -hmm. legislation to restrict where they go if we can't control one, two, and three. Yeah, I mean, in other words, for example, if you didn't want them in the downtown, um, you could do that too, yeah. Or you can, you know, you can use this geocoding functionality that actually sets the corrals up to allow them to be on the seven line, but not on Kirkwood, right? Plus or minus, it's not a perfect science. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of different tools. We have attempted, I think what's going on in part with, um, with the data that I've seen is, first of all, remember, scooters were basically not here for two years, right? We, there were some that were out there but, but it was, you know, most of the companies have pulled their, the majority of their fleets away and just put them in a warehouse and waited out the pandemic. So what we're seeing is shocking to the system, in part because it's so different than what we've been used to seeing. Um, and, and, I, and I think that some of that is what, what, is, what is happening. But I do think that there's an ongoing problem. And I think that the plan that uh, Director Wason's proposing and all of us, you know, worked on together, I think is a, is a good start. Uh, but I don't think it's the end of it. Thank you. More follow-up later. Okay. Any additional questions uh, or comments? Councilmember Sims. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Crowley. Um, and I do agree it is a shock to our system with the scooters. However, the shock comes in waves of seven or 8,000 every year. And at the beginning, when we did all these scooters, they had this launch where they were giving out helmets and training and all that stuff. But I don't see that that's happened since. And would you agree that's part of the, the educational part that, that I've heard mentioned a couple times? Um, yeah, it's a problem, and we have to deal with it. But me as a council person, I don't want to sit here and put that all in our lap. It's them that's making the money. It's them that we made the agreement with. Yeah. So pressure need to be put on them to clean up what it is the problem. Yeah, 
No, I, I totally agree with you. I, we did, we did actually did have educational sessions during the pandemic yeah. on Zoom. You can imagine how wildly popular they were. Um, but, uh, but you know, there is a fair amount of communication that they have with their writers. So there is an ongoing communication. Obviously, it's not having the entirely, you know, the total effect that we want it to have, and it and it certainly can be improved. Um, I do see it as a uh, responsibility of the scooter companies, and I think that. Pr I should say that they have been very responsive when we've come to them with a particular issue. So we, you know, even if it's just a kind of tactical thing, so let, you know, I get an email from someone or a phone call or even from a fellow employee saying, hey, you know, there are 25 scooters parked at the bike rack at the library, that's probably not a good idea. And I, you know, and I get a picture and it's a, you know, I want, you know what's one of the companies? I will get, be in touch with that company and say, stop doing that. You can't put more than five there or whatever, right? And they actually are very responsive on that front. So um, where, where it's harder, I think, and, and, and just kind of, frankly, a, a, ch a challenge is how do we get riders to park correctly, right? If we could do that, then it's not problem solved, but at least it's largely uh, significantly better than what we're seeing right now. And every year, there's, you know, a bunch of new students that come, and there are a bunch of students that go, and, you know, I got some data from IU. IU impounds, right? Uh, they, they are very aggressive on campus. Um, and just to give you a sense of, like, the problems are worse at the start of the year. Um, according to their data, they're usually in the 60 to 80 range of impounding scooters on an average academic month. They've impounded 200 in August. So it's, it's more than three times the number that they ordinarily on an average basis impound. So that says to me, there's a learning curve at the start of a semester, um, and, and you know that's the data that's, that uh, supports that. Okay, thank you, and IU has a dedicated staff that's doing that. Um, they as do. You, as you're well right. aware, and but part of your statement is that you know, I see it all the time. Now, I know you're just one person, and you're not everywhere, but to say I see it all the time means exponentially, this is a problem. Um, I'm out of time, can I have one slight question? Yes, please follow up. I just haven't seen any uh, a budgetary designation for BEDC, the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. Where does that support lie in the budget format? That's in the general fund, ESD's is that in general, general fund? fund. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Additional questions, comments from council members? Uh, council member Smith? I'm oh, sorry, and then Councilmember Rowland. Uh, Thank you, Councilmember uh, Smith. I know you get you get picked on about the scooters a lot, <laughs> but I have to ask this question after they've been around for a while: um, What is the economic development benefit to have these scooters in our city? Uh, I I'm I'm mostly at a loss to figure out really what the benefit is, um, you know, to our economy. I would answer that in two ways. Uh, one, which was recently captured in the IU student government report that, was, that they produced and issued to their administration, uh, advocating for the continuation of scooters on campus. And what they talked about was um, affordability, affordability of movement, um, and uh, convenience, right? So the... Um, Majority of people using scooters are likely students or uh, that age group. So I, I put a certain amount of credence in that. They don't really have a vested interest, you know, financial or any way, uh, to, to either support or be against scooters. So, so, you know, I read that report. I was interested by that. From our perspective, um, I think it's, um, you know, that there, if you, you know, if you stand on 10th Street at 615, which is what I was doing the other day, coming out of a Kelly class, there are like a zillion students coming and going. Many of them are scootering. Um, and, you know, my, there's still a lot of people in their cars, which I find shocking. But there, you know, so there's a certain amount of, I think, dis displacement, um, either from cars, possibly from buses. Um, but I think that there's a, you know, there's an impact to our TDM, frankly, or, or you know, who's who's getting around town, how, um, and it it relieves some of the pressure on uh, vehicle travel. Now, you know, there's questionable 
claims that student that 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 uh, scooter companies make about exactly the off offset because it gets involved in like battery recharging and stuff like that. But a lot of them are actually moving to a model where they're not taking. I mean, it was terrible when they would you know the scooter would be left at the end of the day. They would drive a diesel or whatever big truck up and load everything in and drive it away and charge it on a uh, coal generated you know power source and then bring it back. Um, a lot of them are moving to, re to replaceable battery uh, models, and so I think that that does cut down on some of that kind of hmm. uh, uh, carbon heavy, you know. I have uh, one more question in 20 seconds. Yeah. Can you just tell me what the fee is for each scooter company? You for, that they pay us? Yes. They pay us $10,000 a year plus 15 cents per ride um, and how many companies do we have in Bloomington? Now? We have three companies. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Councilmember Volan. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, following up on Councilmember Smith's uh, question, how much does that translate to? How much revenue is coming in from scooters altogether per year? Well, on average, I mean, we've, so we've had about 220,000, I think, something like that, over the, since, we'll just call it the beginning of 2019, so that's 19, 20, 21 and a half, right? So, um, call it, who wants to do the math with for me? 60,000 a year. Give What's that? 60,000 a year. Six, yeah, 60, but, you know, keeping in mind that uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to average it out because the... Uh, pandemic was right in the middle of that. So there was a significant depression of, of usage during that period. So I think to really have an accurate number, we have to let a run rate go for a period, a healthy period of time. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, secondly, uh, where in the budget scooter numbers would show up? Because I see exactly one use of the word scooter in the entire budget book. Like, where, where would I go to find the actual revenue? In, what, in which fund, in which line, of which department? I would have to defer. I don't know if uh, um, Director Underwood is, or Controller Underwood is, is here. Um, is it coded in a particular way? Uh, it goes into the general fund. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the budget is an expenditure budget. Um, it, it, we don't drill down into revenues, particularly in this, these presentations. Uh, we do provide that information uh, on the state required forms, uh, but I can find the particular line for you um, that would show up in um, our annual cities and towns report. Well, which uh, department claims the revenue? I would have to look to see how it's coded. We don't, we don't track necessarily revenue by department. The general fund is the general fund that funds a lot of different departments. So we don't do specific income statements uh, where it's revenue and expenditures out of that department. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear me, but I just lost my uh, audio. So um, uh, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, I, I missed the, the part. Uh, okay, I missed the part that uh, Mr. Underwood just said about where, but I'm, you know, I'm more than a little surprised that uh, there's no obvious claimant for those revenues or that they're not broken out. And I'd like to see them broken out, be very specific, like to know about, we can estimate from the, uh, the revenue and now I'm out of time. Uh, um, I'll just finish the sentence and I'll come back for more questions. But uh, we can estimate from the revenue how many scooter rides are happening. So that just by itself would be a useful data point. Thank well, you. If I can, if answer. you have a quick response, please. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, we we actually we we actually track the number of rides, so we don't have to we we don't have to uh, reverse engineer that number because that's actually the number that we use to to issue invoicing. Uh, so we have an understanding of of that data. We also track at the department level, just as part of our own manual process, we track revenues coming in. I think what uh, Controller Underwood was saying was that they get dumped into the, uh, into the general fund, um, but we have that data on an on a aggregate and, and, and ride basis. Okay. 
But that's great. Um, like I see with other departments, it's the kind of thing that the kind of data that I mean, look at the questions from the various council members. We're all interested in the question of scooters. Uh, you know, where is the data that tells us what's going on? I don't care if it was skewed during the pandemic. Let us see it like we see everything else. So and again, I'll, I'll come back for more questions. Thank you for that. Additional questions, uh, Councilmember Scambellari. Yes, thank you. And just let's stay with scooters, shall we? <laughs> um, so, uh, did I did it. I understand you correctly that the money, the revenues we get from licensing for scooters and for for just scooter rides and so forth, is goes to the general fund, but is used to help fund public works efforts at enforcement. Did I understand that correctly? Uh, it is our, well, it has not yet to, to date, um, because there haven't really been uh, specific cost, cost specific items that, that have tapped out revenue. But I think the understanding is that the plan that has been proposed for the fall as a pilot will tap that revenue, um, and, and also future plans will tap that revenue. Okay. So uh, that's what it's intended for. It's really intended as a, as a kind of way for us to cover our costs. So it's, a, it's an appropriate and, way of using it. And quite literally, what is that? What do those enforcement efforts look like? Is that hiring additional staff to walk around with scanners to actually record violations? Yeah, I think there were several steps. Uh, one, one is that a couple. Well, not recording. It's going to be you know cleanup and 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 taking pictures and making sure that we can go back and 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 do a better job tracking when something has been mostly anecdotal, but also cleaning up, right? So not just seeing a, a thing in the middle of the sidewalk, taking a picture and walking away, but but actually solving the problem while you're there. So there's that. There's also corral work, so looking at uh, putting in some parking corrals and using geocoding to be able to manage, especially high intensity areas. Um, so that's part of the plan as well. There was something else, and I don't remember the third thing, but. Uh, we'll come back. Yeah. And have we assessed any fines to any scooter companies at all yet? No. And if when we do, where does that money go? Does that go into the general fund as well? Yeah, unless it's set up differently, we would we would you know we would probably be the ones to well, actually I'm not sure, but but I think that money would follow the other money. Uh, it could be tracked and understood to be different a different pot perhaps, but um, uh, yeah, it would follow into the general fund. Okay, thank you. Additional questions or comments from council members, um, Deputy Mayor Griffin. If you had a follow up to that question, yeah. please go ahead. You know, as far as uh, uh, how we institute uh, policing of it, uh, at, we'll have Adam when he's up here. He can explain to you a little bit more about our plans. And I know we've y'all received a memo as well about our plans, didn't you? Want to make sure that y'all receive that. But we'll uh, we'll have more more to come. You 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 did. Yeah, we had a memo from the mayor that uh, we that we did send you. Okay. We'll make sure we have a mixed mixed uh, response <laughs> via shrugs <laughs> from the council members, <laughs> so I'm not positive about that. Perhaps as it sent made to council it to office yet. on Friday. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll follow up. Uh, any additional questions, Councilmember Volan? Yes, thank you. Um, got audio back here. Um, I wanted to address the question, a, a question about the Trade District Garage. Uh, again, if it's roughly $12.5 million uh, capital cost and uh, the average lifespan of a garage is 50 years, um, we're looking at a cost of roughly a quarter million dollars a year to uh, own that garage if I've done my math right. Um, and uh, if it's being used uh, at substantially less than capacity, um, then it begs the question, you know, how much are we going to write off? Because this is, a, this is a, not a, a building, parking garages are not buildings that are built to last. They're, you know, uh, in, in a way, some of our garages, we had to treat like a depreciable asset. Um, so I guess my question to you is, how do you think, think about the money we're basically having to write off because the garage is basically, um, there's no market for it until buildings are built in the trades district. And more specifically, how many years do you expect before the trades district will be built out so that the garage will have made sense? 
I'm not sure that I'm the right person to answer your write-off question. I mean, I think there's a, there's a kind of probably controller element, and, I'm, and, and I'd be happy to yeah. follow up with him and uh, get back to you on that. On the second front, you know, I think um, there was always an anticipation that the garage would precede the demand for its capacity. Um, and that is the nature of, of you know, these new developments, where you have greenfield developments and you need to attract tenants, and those tenants are going to need parking. They need to be convinced that you're going to have parking available when they invest either as developers or as tenants they come to work for a company. So there's always going to be a lag. I think part of the lag that's happening right now was unforeseen at the time that we really were kicking the project off. Um, which I, I know that, and I'd like to be more specific in my question. I mean, I, I, there's a reason I voted for the garage, despite my better judgment. That was the reason. What I'm asking is not, um, sh you know, should we accept that there's going to be losses? My question is, uh, how long are we prepared? For how many years are we prepared to write off uh, the basically unused, like the, the value of the garage is in, uh, leveraging development. You know, how many years um, are we going to uh, take a loss on this garage until it's being used to its full capacity? I mean, they, I, I, I would like to maybe uh, wonder if the controller could uh, uh, weigh in here and how we should think about that amortization. Well, again, I think he can answer that question of amortization. I would say to you, we have a high sense of urgency <clears throat> to get that project back back up and running. And and uh, you know, again, um, it's it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. People are like, we were locked in our basements for two years, and then we come out of our basements, and we expect the entire world to be ready to go. And it's not. It's the office market is going to take time. I could have the trades district develop tomorrow morning if we relaxed our, our expectations and standards for it and our strategy for it. That there, there is no lack of student housing developers that have come begging to put developments on that. So it's not why is there no interest in the trades district, it's why is the, tr the interest that of the, from the people that we're looking for taking longer than we thought and, and how patient are we willing to be? And I think that you have to take a long view of this. The trades district is gonna be, is gonna deliver its promise against this promise. It's just where it Mr. coming Crowley, out of a weird I do time. Take a, I, yeah. I do take a long view of this. I'm asking the specific question is, uh, how much are we spending to take that long view? How much uh, you know, of the value of the garage is going to depreciate because for three years, five years, 10 years, it wasn't maxed out. I mean, it's one thing to take a chance. It's another thing to uh, acknowledge the cost the, the real world cost of the 10, let, let's say it's three, five years uh, of useful life of the garage that was wasted because there was no one there to use it. That, uh, and, and that's what I'm going for is uh, not, because again, I voted for the garage and I'm trying not to regret it. <laughs> All right. And so I'd Cuts like to your measure. Your, your time expired maybe a minute I, or so ago. I, I know. And I will follow up, if I may just respond to say, we will follow up between the controller's office and, and, and our office. We will follow up on uh, that very specific question you just asked. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions, final comments from council members? Has Isabel Piedmont Smith, or council member Piedmont Smith, rather, please go ahead. Are we on comments now? If you would like to be, yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, uh, Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Griffin, for reminding us that there was a mention of the scooters in the memo from the mayor that we received last Friday. Um, and I, I do look forward to hearing more about the, um, the pilot enforcement program, the parking corrals, et cetera, um, as we get uh, the Adam Wason show tomorrow evening with <laughs> the big public works budget. Um, however, what was really disheartening to me is that in that memo, it also says, and I quote, Enforcement measures such as issuing fines for individual violations and impounding scooters could require significant staff time. It may be more cost effective and efficient to recommend to the Board of Public Works an increase in the company's annual license payment and or per ride fees as an enforcement alternative to staff demanding enforcement measures. This to me is a, a non-starter. I mean, obviously they are not enforcing the rules themselves. 
they have proven themselves incapable of doing that unless we bring the hammer down and say, look, we're going to start fining you significantly. And so I, 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 I understand that there, there's a desired balance by the administration to say, okay, this is a good, possibly lower carbon footprint method of transportation, and we want it, it's, it's cool and all that. But on the other hand, they have flaunted our rules and violated repeatedly and my own attempts to get them to enforce things have come to naught. And, and we haven't done anything, and, and yet the memo says we're going to recommend an increase in the fees. Well, why don't you start fining instead? I mean, they're going to just say, oh, that's the cost of doing business. Sure, I'll give you 15000 instead of 10000 No, we want them to pay for every time there's a violation, else they're not going to change their behavior. And the change in, in rider behavior is going to come from them being banned by the scooter companies from continuing to ride. So I, that's, that's what's frustrating to me. So this is council comment. Um, I know you're both at the podium. You want to you converse, converse on this, and I'm happy to converse about it later. But that's, that's frustrating to me. Thank you. Additional comments from council members? Uh, council member Rosenberger. I think I got to get in on the scooter talk. Um, I, I just want to say I take a, I would say a very general approach, and this is not about the budget, but um, to uh, obstructions to sidewalks. And I think if we're talking about scooters, we have to take a very serious look also at trash and recycling bins. Uh, every household in my neighborhood has two bins, and it's a lot harder to step over. I mean, I'm an able body human. It's a lot harder to get around a trash and recycling bin on a sidewalk than it is to step over a scooter. And so I think if we're finding folks for um, a scooter in the sidewalk, we also need to find households for trash and recycling bins not placed where they should be. Um, there are a lot. There are just a lot of obstructions on sidewalks, including like tree roots, you know, like missing links, really big cracks that we should also be taking a look at. So I, I just hope that what we can do here is not limit this discussion to one thing that's blocking a sidewalk. Additional final comments from council members. Councilmember Rallo. Oh sure. Um, I, it really does undervalue pedestrians to allow scooter companies to, uh, or, or people who ride scooters to uh, block entire sidewalks. I don't see the uh, trash bins blocking entire sidewalks, and I suppose maybe the word could go out to sanitation workers. We could tell, discuss this with uh, Director Ways and tomorrow that um, people place or the the, the workers. Um, take care in terms of placing the uh, the bins in an appropriate place, but I've seen many, many examples of scooters that are just lying across entire sidewalks, and so this is really problematic for pedestrians, especially with those with disabilities. Um, and I think that in, in, it's just uh, mystifying to me why we can't enforce it. It seems that we do ticket cars um, in neighborhood parking zones, for instance, um, that are there inappropriately. Um, and I'm sure that those officers are passing scooters as they're driving around. They could simply stop and, and uh, take, uh, you know, find those, uh, find the scooter companies, take a picture of them, and so forth. So I see it fundamentally differently, uh, the difference between sanitation and and these scooters, and I frankly, I don't see any value in the scooters. I think that it's, um, they're built to essentially to throw away after 40 rides or something. I don't think that they're, they really have an important contribution, but the important thing is, is enforcement of the code. And so uh, I'm sure we'll continue talking about this, but again, I, I think if it doesn't happen, I think that the appropriate thing to do is to revoke the contract and just simply for the council to write legislation to that effect. And I'm happy to do that soon. And I think judging from this council, it would probably garner support for it. So, and that would be, that would be the solution. So, thanks. Additional final comments, council member Volan.
Yeah, um, I, I've been looking into the code about uh, why we exactly allow bins on the sidewalks and, you know, looking for uh, uh, what other cities do. They put their bins on the grass and they put their bins in the street, uh, but the bins shouldn't be on the sidewalk in the first place. But we have to have a conversation about that. Um, more to the point of this budget, uh, when it comes to, uh, I mean, I get a sense of don't worry your heads about these things. We're going to take care of them, whether it's a lack of reported data on scooters, a lack of willingness to acknowledge an investment that's gone badly, like the Trade Sister Garage. Uh, it's one thing to um, have a white elephant. It's another thing to uh, not acknowledge the white elephant. Yes, I know it's been open only over a year, but you can see that the, da the data uh, shows that there's not uh, there's almost no demand for the trades district garage, and uh, in general, like I just don't like this pattern that says that that seems to imply uh, we'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Okay, the council is asking if I mean uh, just the what I'm hearing about the desire to more stringently regulate scooters ought to be a message to the administration that uh, this is not acceptable. This kind of uh, response is not acceptable. Um, I think that uh, we need to acknowledge that the cost of the trade system garage, the, it, you know, it's, we're, we're losing money on it big time. Uh, the, the building itself is, a, you know, Let's call it three hundred, three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year when you add interest. Uh, for how many years are we going to carry that cost? Uh, like the the administration has to be frank about the um, the losses represents to acknowledge it. We all want to come up with a solution here. Again, I want to emphasize I voted for that garage despite my better judgment. But I will say again what I said years ago about this garage. Uh, just try and come back and ask us for a garage for the convention center. If it's true that a convention center really needs a garage to work, I mean, I'm just going to be like, I don't believe it anymore. I certainly don't believe it. I've, I've been an, uh, adamantly against convention center garage in the first place. Uh, but now, like, show me uh, hard data. Like, I, I'm, I'm just not going to believe a pitch like that anymore. So I would uh, ask uh, Mr. Crowley and the department to, you know, uh, come to data Jesus. I don't have a better phrase than that about uh, these issues. Uh, you know, they, I think they're very serious and you're risking council action. Thank you. Council Member Um Yes, thank you. There, there's, there's a lot going on in this discussion around this particular budget, isn't there? Um, so let me try and organize these thoughts. First, I do want to acknowledge some things that I think are going very well with this department. I especially want to acknowledge um, outside funds brought in to do work in Bloomington. So thank you for the role you had in bringing in the outside investments through the EDA grant, through the Catalan uh, expansion, um, through the federal matches for TDM that you're going to be working on. So, so thank you for that good work, and I do support that. Um, that said, I do, I do have some questions that I think are important ones. Scooter enforcement, obviously we spent a lot of time talking about that tonight. I think that's an interesting issue because on the one hand it is tied to ESD, on the other hand you're essentially a pass-through for these monies that, 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 well, that come from scooter companies. Um, so I still have some questions about that. I don't think we have hit our stride, but that's not necessarily about your budget, that's about a more systemic issue um, with how those funds are handled. Um, add to this, I do, more relevant to the ESD budget, I would like to see more data on some of the, the efforts that we've already funded thus far. So in other words, in terms of workforce development and upskilling and reskilling, I'd like to see how that's actually worked out. Um, I think we all have high hopes for it, we all believe in the importance of that kind of work. I want to see how we've done so far. Um, so I'm actually going to be passing tonight, but I thank you for the presentation. I thank my colleagues um, for the very robust discussion. So. Additional comments, questions? Uh, is that a yes? Councilmember Sims, go ahead. 
It's a subtle hand movement. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, just a quick comment, and thank you for the presentation again. And um, this council, when we were talking about uh, the ED lit and passing it, this council asked a lot of departments such as yourself for a lot of things. And I think for the most part, we're, we're delivering. Right? We're still having some debate and we want some details. And I think most of them will be answered through via the questions that we submit and then those responses. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing those. Um, but I think we're on the right track. Uh, we do have some issues as with this robust discussion tonight. Um, I do have some comments later, and particularly with Trades District and parking and these on down the line. But to me, that's not a budget related item as much tonight. Uh, future, you know, I, I get that, the philosophy. Um, but I took a broader view when I voted to uh, approve that as well. And yes, we have some issues, but I also know some future plans, and hopefully it'll meet what it is that we thought it would, and I, I still anticipate that. So um, I plan to support this budget tonight. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly uh, note that I think the conversation around scooter licensing and revenues uh, highlights again the need for better information on, on revenues as they relate to how they populate various funds, where those revenues go. Um, I, you know, we, we were told to look at the annual financial reports, which I've been doing. Uh, there's information that those have, which is great. There's also information that they don't really have uh, that I would like to know. I'm not sure where to find it. It's obviously in a different form. Uh, I think we can work on a way to integrate that information in a, in a way that better informs the types of questions council members are asking, as well as the public, about the full picture from revenue to fund uh, to expenditure. Uh, and I think it highlights, too, that you know, there's a lot of instances where we've got a revenue stream that we don't really know anything about that goes straight to the general fund and then gets spent, you know, wherever and the many, you know, the myriad places the general fund gets spent. And, and I'm sure there are countless examples of that where no council member could tell you like really what's going on with that at all. And I think that's like not a good state of affairs for fiscal oversight and management. So that's fundamentally what I'm really trying to address when I'm talking about these revenue issues. Uh, when we tease these things out and learn about them, it enables us to make uh, better informed judgments with respect to are we meeting you know, our, our fiscal responsibility and goals, uh, or responsibilities to constituents, and also the, you know, the stated goals that we have as a community. Um, I feel like sometimes our spending is out of step with you know, our stated values and goals. And I think you know, transportation spending is one, one area. You know, there's a disproportionate level going to certain modes and not others and that sort of thing. Um, when we know these things, we could take action with either through, you know, affecting the budget process or through um, uh, legislative action. We could designate in Bloomington Municipal Code that scooter licensing fees and revenues go directly into a specific fund for a specific purpose. We could do that. Uh, we could do that with many other uh, types of revenue as well. But we have to know the information first, and that's what has been frustratingly difficult to, to get in some respects. Um, so just wanted to highlight that issue because I think it's undercutting kind of the whole budget uh, discussion so far for me this year. Um, and that's it for me. Any other final comments from council members? And with that, if there's no objection, we can go ahead and call the roll on a due pass recommendation for the um, Economic and Sustainable Development Department budget. Thank you. Does the motion need to be made? Uh, no, uh, by unanimous consent. I'm just uh, asking for the for the question. Thank you, Deputy Clerk Stoll. Council Member Sims. Yes. Scambalori. Pass. Sandberg. Pass. Rallo. Pass. Flaherty. <coughs> yes. Smith. Pass. Piedmont Smith. Pass. Rosenbarker. Pass. Bolin. No. Thank you. That vote is 216. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Carley and ESD staff. Uh, and with that, we can move on to our next departmental budget presentation, which is the Community and Family Resources Department. And we will welcome Ms. Calendar Anderson to the podium to present. Good evening, council members. 
My name is Beverly Callender Anderson, and I'm the director of the Community and Family Resources Department. I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the department's 2023 budget request this evening. I also want to thank the controller's office and the mayor's office for all of their support uh, putting this together, especially Cheryl Gill Gilliland in the controller's office. The Community and Family Resources Department helps to improve the quality of life in Bloomington by coordinating programs and services designed to strengthen community engagement and to increase the overall community capacity to address social issues. Promoting volunteerism, enhancing community wellness, coordinating public safety education initiatives, and addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion are a few of the ways CFRD staff work to promote and enhance quality of life for all Bloomington residents and visitors and help to build a strong and vital community. CFRD operates with nine full-time employees and currently three interns. Our divisions include the Bloomington Volunteer Network, which is currently staffed by Interim Director Michelle Moss, who assumed that role when longtime director Lucy Shake resigned earlier this year. Our Latino outreach programs are coordinated by Josefa Madrigal, the Safe and Civil City program functions under, direct, under the direction of Shatoya Moss, and the After Hours Ambassador program is coordinated by Charles Culp. The department provides support to six commissions, the Council for Community Accessibility, the Monroe County Domestic Violence Coalition, and the Future of Policing Task Force. Michael Shermas and Marissa Parr Scott, along with those previously mentioned, serve as liaisons to those commissions, councils, and coalitions. Our department is rounded out by Aubrey Cedar, who serves as the Office Manager Program Assistant and helps keep us organized and supports a variety of departmental programs along with our three interns. In addition to the work of the divisions mentioned in the past 12 months, CFRD has given leadership to anti-racism, equity and inclusion initiatives, shelter and housing and security working groups, helping Bloomington Monroe, the community's online resource hub, and the Future of Policing Task Force. We have planned and implemented over 39 programs and coordinated the selection and presentation of 22 awards for outstanding community engagement. These programs and awards are made possible through the support of corporate sponsors and donations exceeding $128,000, for which we are grateful. The CFRD staff never ceases to amaze me with their creativity and flexibility, and I want to take this public opportunity to thank them for going above and beyond every day to make sure programs and initiatives are educational, inspirational, and meaningful. CFRD began 2022 with 42 budget goals. I will highlight just a few of those here and the remainder you can read about in your packets. In the area of engagement, we promoted and increased usage of Helping Bloomington Monroe by offering monthly HBM 101 sessions for helpers, including two Spanish language sessions and sessions that were tailored specifically for city staff. While I'm on the topic of helping Bloomington Monroe, I want to note that although the number of overall searches decreased in the year ending January 31st, 2022, sort of following the pandemic, but we're still in the pandemic, um, the top three search categories remain the same. They are housing, food, and health care. Also in the area of engagement, the Commission on the Status of Children and Youth completed phase one of the Youth Participatory Budgeting Project with the install installation of three drinking fountains in Bryan Waldron Hill and Buzzkirk and RCA Parks. And while we're speaking of commissions, the Commission on the Status of Black Males hosted a virtual Black Male Summit in, for middle and high school males with 95 participants. The sessions included sports and career success, mental health and mindfulness, and masculinity and sexuality. In the area of diversity, we served on the planning team for the anti-racism training for all city elected officials and department heads that um, HR Director Shaw spoke about on Monday. The planning team was instrumental in interviewing consultants and selecting the training group, as well as coordinating monthly training sessions and personalized consultant sessions, which will continue through the fall. The department coordinated multi-generational events for Black History and Latinx Heritage Months, including the Black History Month Essay Contest, Health Fair, and Vaccine Clinic, the virtual Black History Month Gala, Fiesta del Otoño, which focused on the tradition of the quinceanera, movies in the park, 
and a bilingual Latin percussion in Venezuelan maracas workshop. In the area of safety, civility, and justice, we're providing ongoing support for the Future of Policing Task Force. The task force completed and submitted its initial report and recommendations in April 2022. Members continue to research innovative and creative initiatives in law enforcement nationwide. We administered the downtown outreach grants in the amount of $250,000 to nine local nonprofits working with Bloomington's unhoused residents or those in danger of becoming homeless. Now I'll move on to CFRD's 2023 budget goals. And for the sake of time, I won't be sharing every departmental goal which appears in your packet, but we'll highlight a few. In the area of engagement, our goals are to stand up to public access to increase the public's access to Bloomington Monroe, helping Bloomington Monroe by standing up two dedicated kiosks in high usage agencies. We'll celebrate community engagement with the annual Be More Awards, increasing nominations by 10% to at least 77. We'll pilot a downtown ambassador corps to assist the after hours ambassador by employing two residents with lived experience on a part-time basis to help monitor various sectors of the downtown for cleanliness, noise, and persons in the need, and to provide hospitality, such as giving directions to local venues during large events. We'll coordinate and monitor the $250,000 downtown outreach grant to fund a minimum of nine projects that will improve the human condition of Bloomington residents who are unhoused or at risk of homelessness. And along with the Economic and Sustain Sustainable Development Department and Parks and Recreation, we'll coordinate the Blackie Brown Arts Festival to highlight the works of a minimum of 20 artists of color in the visual and performing arts. One of our new initiatives is that our Latino outreach program is in the process of becoming a certified acceptance agent. And that's a location where individuals seeking an individual taxpayer identification number or an I-10 can submit their application and paperwork, have it validated, and then submit it to the Internal Revenue. Having this function locally within the department increases accessibility for residents seeking an I-10. It will eliminate residents being separated from their important paperwork and also eliminates the likelihood of that paperwork being lost in the postal system. So as you know, boards and commissions enable residents to participate in the government process and perform a vital role in making democracy work at a local level. The six commissions, along with the council's coalitions and task forces, CFRD support, all work very hard and most have a signature program. A few of the upcoming commission initiatives include the Commission on Aging. They will be developing a pocket-sized resource guide for residents 50 and over, and 50 and over are seniors, in case you didn't know. Um, the Martin Luther King Birthday Celebration Commission will coordinate an arts history event for MLK Remembrance Day in April of 23. And the Commission on Hispanic and Latino Affairs will assist with the recruitment of volunteers and provide income tax preparation assistance to Spanish-speaking residents. We'll increase the number of returns completed by 40%. As Corporate Counsel Beth Cape mentioned during her presentation earlier this week, we've also been in discussion about transferring the non-legal functions of the Human Rights Commission to CFRD at the end of the year. Those discussions are ongoing. We've requested funding from phase three of the American Rescue Plan Act in order to invest $125,000 into local neighborhoods through violence prevention grants, providing operational assistance to help prevent, interrupt, or reduce violence through evidence-based services offered by grassroots organizations, neighborhood associations, or other community-based organizations. I will also use this funding to coordinate QPR and mental health first aid trainings for 100 people, including our nonprofit partners and frontline city staff. These trainings will be provided free of charge. QPR stands for question, persuade, and refer. These are three steps anyone can learn to prevent suicide. And the goal of the mental health first aid course is to learn the risk factors and warning signs for mental health and substance misuse. 
but they also um, teach strategies for how to help someone in both crisis and non-crisis situations and where to turn for help. So earlier this year when the ED lit was passed, uh, it was said that those funds will allow the city to address for future critical needs and meet fundamental obligations to residents. CFRD will administer $1 million of the ED lit that has been set aside to help ease the burden this tax increase will have on working individuals and families. And so now for our budget highlights. The Community and Family Resources Department budget is $2,209,712. This is an increase of $975,626. Significant changes include Category 1, uh, where our personnel request, and that number is not right, but anyway. Our personnel request is $879,646, which is an increase of $94,018. And this, is, this reflects a 5% cost of living increase for non-union staff and the funding of a new program specialist position. In category three, our request is $1,320,548, or an increase of $879,808. And that increase is from the ED lit for the economic equity fund and increases in instruction, dues and subscriptions, and the grants line. In 2023, Community and Family Resources Department total budget request um, is $2,209,712, as I stated earlier. And the next slide will show the budget by fund where the, the various um, numbers are coming from that make up that $2,209,000. So the 2023 Community Family Resources budget reflects increases that align with our stated goals of providing opportunities for engagement, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, creating a community environment on a foundation of safety, civility, and justice, and providing support to commissions, boards, and councils. Thank you for your past support of CFRD programs and initiatives and for your consideration of our 2023 budget request. And I'd be happy to entertain comments or answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for that presentation, Ms. Callender Anderson. Mm -hmm. And thank you to you and CFRD staff for your work. Uh, do we have any council member questions to kick us off? Council member Scamillary, go ahead. Yes, thank you. At what level are we supporting the Stride Center? Oh gosh, um, I think it's 50,000, but I'm sorry, is it 50? Okay, yeah, $50,000. And how does that compare to other local partners who are also supporting it? So, it, so different partners are supported in different ways, and so some get grant funding. This is not necessarily a grant fund. This is something that we um, committed to when the Stride Center first opened. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're also funding, helping to fund the um, housing security network with probably more than that. Um, but I can get you, we can get a breakdown of that. But okay, yeah, yeah I, I'd appreciate that. All right, um, And also, thank you for, in the documents you shared for the, the mentioning the economic equity fund that, that comes with the ED lit revenue. Can you share whatever you can about how that will be administered and, and, how, and how decisions are gonna be made yeah. for that. So we, yeah, so we have an internal group that has been meeting about that and, and trying to figure out how we're going to do it. We hope to work with nonprofit partners in the community that are all, already working with families and individuals that would um, be eligible for these funds and um, we're just looking at, at the various subject, or various areas where we would award that, that funding. So uh, we're probably looking to limit it to about $500 per family or individual um, in different areas. Yeah. And are you able to share um, which nonprofits are, are, or are we, helping inform those decisions? Or? So we haven't spoken to them yet, so I don't want to say names out loud. So, they're um, not so we're still meeting internally, trying to figure out which ones would be the most appropriate. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. 
Um, my question has to do with the violence prevention grants. Mm -hmm. Can you give a little more um, guideline as to what exactly that evidence-based um, those prevention services look like and uh, how that will be recommended to the various uh, neighborhood associations and, and folks that will be executing those? Yeah. So again, because this is in the budget and the funding hasn't been approved yet, we haven't carried out you know, a total plan for it, but um, at, as we are doing with the future policing task force, we're looking at um, programs from around the country and what's been working in other communities, um, not just in the Midwest, not just in Indiana, but all around the country. There are different programs that have been working. We've seen programs that are utilizing trusted members of communities, you know, to just help work with them to lower violence in communities. And we realize that every community or every neighborhood is different, and so what, what might work in Bryant Park may not work in McDowell, may not work in Peppergrass, may not work in you know some of the others. And so that's why we want to work with people specifically in those neighborhoods um, to come up with those programs. So things like neighborhood watches, you know, kind of the typical. It could be neighborhood watch. About. It could be a youth, um, you know, violence prevention program. It could be. It could be almost anything that um, you know someone in the community thinks would work and then we have evidence that it has worked before, so. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Yes, thank you, Ms. Calendar Anderson. Um, so uh, the $250,000 from the parking meter fund, is that what's then used for the community downtown outreach? Grants? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and then uh, can you tell us more about the new position that's proposed, the program specialist position? So we're looking at a program specialist position that basically will do some of the uh, work with the nonprofits that are working with um, housing issues, homelessness issues, um, other, other services to low income residents. Um, and what it will do, and I, I heard Director Zodi say the same thing earlier, that it will allow him some free time to do some other things, and that's exactly what this will do, is that it will allow some of what I've been doing to be done with, by someone else and for me to do some things that have been neglected. So uh, would this be somebody who kind of specializes on helping the unhoused in our community, or? Not necessarily the unhoused, but at least uh, lower income um, residents in the community. Okay. So and it's not specifically unhoused, but it, but it will, that will involve unhoused or, or those in risk of becoming homeless or, um, yeah. And will that be at the same level as your other program? Coordinators. It will. It's a Category 7 position. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Volan. Uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith uh, asked my question. I just wanted to ask uh, Beverly Calendar Anderson, who she's calling a senior. <laughs> <laughs> if the shoe fits. Because I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Additional council member questions? Council member Rallo? Yes, thank you for your presentation, uh, Director Calendar Anderson. I was, uh, we were told in the previous presentation by uh, Director Alex Crowley that um, funds related to local food was, were now transferred to your department. Yes. And I wondered about the amount and what that would be used for uh, and, and so forth. Could you I, expound on that? Yeah, um, I am going to, I believe it's 47,000, but I'm going to refer that to Controller Underwood to see if I've got that right, because I don't want to give you wrong information, but I believe it's $47,000. And I'm not sure if he's there. Well, if he's not there, we'll figure it out. Um, and what it will be used for is um, working on food insecurity. There are places where, you know, it's, there are some food deserts in the community and, and trying to get fresh food or, or just nutritious food to those places and probably working with some other entities in, in the community to leverage those funds because that's not a whole lot. Yeah, that's probably not enough, but it, it's important work. I see that uh, Controller Underwood is there so he can verify the 
amount? Yes, the amounts uh, out of the ED lit is 46,500. So close. Okay, so close. and will that be used, sorry, will that be used for personnel or will it be used for an actual? Um, It'll be used for programming. For the program not for, not for personnel. Okay, so uh, a member of your staff will administer it mm -hmm. and the funds will be used potentially for food purchase or to, or what, exactly what, how, how trying to envision so it could, evaluating it, food deserts is an important part, yeah. right? So part of it, and that will be part of it, part of it will be finding out where the need is and looking at that evaluation. We've talked to some folks from IU already and, and started to um, sort of think about how we're gonna put that together. Uh, we've talked to Bloomington Health Foundation. So we're looking at various entities, and like I said, 40, 40 Six five is not a lot of money, and so if we can leverage that with some other funding from some yeah. outside sources, um, you know, it, it could be any number of, of projects. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's important work, so that's good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, more would be needed. It seems to me. Thank mm -hmm. you for that information. Mm -hmm. Any additional council member questions at this time? Seeing none, uh, we can go to the public for comment on the Community and Family Resources Departmental Budget. Uh, if anyone in the chambers would like to comment, please approach the podium. And if anybody watching on Zoom would like to comment, please use the raise hand feature. If you're dialing in, you can dial star nine to request to speak. Or if you're having trouble with these options, uh, feel free to message the meeting host in the chat function to, um, to let them know. Uh, we have a uh, member of the public at the podium. Uh, if you, Please state your name for the record, and you have two minutes. Thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, this isn't really related to community and family resources. I'm sorry about that, but I was really surprised. This is the first time I've seen an indication of where parking meter revenue goes. I had the impression that never made it outside of the parking department, that it was the meter revenue was being used to subsidize the losses in, the, um, in our parking garages. And boy, are there losses. The 4th Street garage was already over-designed. Um, by size, or oversized by design. But since COVID, all the garages are, are way, way down in revenue. So I just wanted to say how much I would love to know what budget is covering those losses if the parking meters aren't. Um, and I apologize if I could have found that information, but I, I failed to. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Do we have anyone uh, joining us online who would like to comment? Uh, Deputy Attorney Kulak. So yes, I have a Sam Dove who wanted to have me read out loud his comment. Mm -hmm. His comment is, why street sign change on block in city? And then I don't believe I see any hands raised on Zoom. Okay, and thank you, Mr. Dove, for your comment. I'll give it a few more seconds. If anyone has a desire to comment, please raise your hand in, the, in Zoom. Seeing no takers. Thank you. Oh wait, with it. there was one. Oh. Right as I said that. Um, R. Miller, I will ask to unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can uh, you hear me? A bit faint, but yes. Barely. Okay, um, my mic just might not be working very well. Renee Miller, um, I was just curious. Um, I didn't hear anything. Um, Director uh, Calendry Anderson about um, the effects of the overturn of Roe v. Wade and how that might um, affect her budget. But I can tell you that the need will be greater. So I hope that uh, everybody supports uh, her budget request. Uh, we're already seeing uh, quite a few agencies, local agencies. Um. Renee Miller, if there's any way to speak up a little bit more, that would be beneficial. We're having a hard time hearing you here in the chambers. And or if, if uh, the folks helping to run the, the audio, if there's a way to turn the volume up, that would be helpful. Hear me better now? Yes, that's a little better, thank you. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, please be sure to speak up. I think we can make that out now. Um, I just didn't hear anything about the um, overturning of Roe v. Wade uh, having any effects on um, the budget for um, the director, and I know that we're seeing an increased need locally, so I hope that everyone supports uh, her budget, and she's going to need more money, and we all are uh, 
as we see the um, effects uh, and needs increase. So thank you. And sorry for the mic uh, issues. That's okay. Thank you for your comment. We got that on the second go around. Any additional public comment from folks joining us on Zoom? No other hands raised. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll return to the council for any additional questions or if folks are ready uh, for final comment on uh, the CFRD budget. Uh, Councilmember Rallo. Yes, um, just to say that um, I think that I appreciate the work that your department's doing a great deal. Um, but I've been passing on departmental budgets, um, although I support many because their work, uh, uh, because um, I'm concerned that we're not keeping pace with the cost of living increases. I, I said that at the onset uh, of the budget hearings. Uh, that is for non-union employees reflected in the base pay. Um, I, I recognize that this is a very large budget comparatively. Uh, we're spending it on a lot of new programs and uh, it's not that I don't support those programs, but I, I'm very concerned about staff uh, compensation. And uh, I'm also, as Councilmember Piedmont Smith uh, described the other evening, I'm, I'm also concerned about what sort of placeholder I should have in mind for uh, AFSCME workers, um, which still have an unresolved contract, and perhaps it will be resolved by the time that we decide on this budget in uh, October. Um, and I also have concerns about police compensation, uh, which I made clear the, the other night about uh, the problems related to recruitment and retention. So those are the main reasons that I've been passing, and I just want to, to uh, say that again, uh, in case people wonder why, um, because there are some very good things that city departments are doing, and uh, so my pass is not a necessary reflection on their work. Um, so just for that clarity, thanks. Additional comments from council members? Uh, council member Sims. Thank you. Um, I definitely will be supporting this budget. Um, but throughout the city, and I can say this about a lot of different departments on the positive effects that they're having in the community from the standpoint of inclusion, um, some equity and definitely some diversity. But through CFRD, um, Safe and Civil City Office, um, the boards and commissions, we can truly see and show that this is a forward-thinking, progressive department that actually lives, actually acts at being inclusive and sharing uh, uh, this city to all across the town. So um, I'm very thankful for that. Thank you and your staff. Um, I just really wanted to acknowledge that. And again, not to neglect any other departments. They all have certain parts that contribute to, to everything in our quality of life, quality of service in, in the city. Uh, but CFRD has done a ton. Um, and I participate a lot. I, you know, I was out of town, so I missed the, the Fairview School. Welcome back to kids. But these are the type of programs. Um, I used to chair commission on the uh, status of black males years ago. So these are outreach ways, ways that we can actually touch people that are not necessarily going to come to these council chambers and you know make comments. So. Uh, kudos to you and your staff. Thank you. I will support this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Additional Council Member comments? Uh, I just wanted to briefly note that, that I'll be voting no tonight uh, just because I still have some outstanding questions with respect to the uh, um, requested appropriation from the parking meter fund, sorry, parking meter fund and some of the uh, uh, BMC and, and statutory requirements around that. So I just wanted to follow up on those. Um, and wanted to share that reasoning with my vote tonight. And with that, uh, unless there's additional comments, I think we're ready for to call the question on um, a due pass recommendation. If the deputy clerk could please call the roll. Council member Scambellari? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Pass. 
Flaherty? No. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Pass. Volan? Pass. Sims? Yes. And that recommendation uh, passes with a vote of 5 1 3. Thank you, Thank Ms. You Calendar Anderson and CFRD staff for all your work and the presentation this evening. Uh, and next, we will welcome our final departmental budget uh, presentation of the evening, the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, Director McDevitt, uh, please proceed when you're ready. Good evening, I'm Paula McDevitt and I am the Director of the Parks and Recreation Department. And I'm pleased to be here this evening to present the Parks and Recreation 2023 General Fund budget request. Before we get started, I would like to introduce the three division directors that are joining us this evening. We have Becky Higgins, our Recreation Services Division Director, and Tim Street, our Operations and Development Division Director, and Satoshi Kido, our Sports Division Director and the newest member of our team. I would also like to thank the staff in the office of the mayor and the controller's office and controller Underwood for their support during the budget preparation. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all the staff in the parks department who all played a role in setting the goals that I'll be sharing with you this evening and our budget request. The Parks and Recreation full-time staff gather every November at a staff retreat, and this past November, we worked on a new mission statement and value list. The Board of Park Commissioners approved the, the mission and values this past February, and this graphic is used on signage, on banners, on meeting agendas, and note cards to guide the work we do every day for the Bloomington community. This infograph is a quick snapshot to highlight the assets that we are responsible for, number of employees, and number of programs, services, and events. The Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department has been nationally accredited since 2001, and we repeat that process every five years. Our last reaccreditation occurred in 2018, uh, 2021, where we received a perfect score on all 154 accreditation standards. Um, in addition, we are a two-time national gold medal winning department. We won for the first time in 2007 and repeated again in 2018 for excellence in park and recreation management. Every five years, the department completes a master planning process. We completed the process in 2020 for the five years that we are currently um, in. This process includes a citizen survey, stakeholder meetings, focus groups, and a complete analysis of all of our properties and program service areas. This slide indicates the top most important issues for the department to focus on in the next five years. The master plan was reviewed and approved by the Board of Park Commissioners in February of 2021. These four goals represent framework for the next five years. Each goal has a set of strategies that the staff use to formulate a five-year strategic action plan. The strategic action plan is also reviewed and approved by the Board of Park Commissioners as part of an uh, accreditation standard. The strategic action plan is what we use to set our annual budget goals. Also at our staff retreat in November, the staff organized into five action teams um, to improve teamwork, improve communication, and achieve goals. Some results since the creation of these action teams include a monthly staff newsletter, improvements to our online seasonal application and pa hiring paperwork, facility survey to create a centralized metric tracking spreadsheet for energy efficiency improvements, and a training on a super grid scheduling module. We have, however, had some challenges this year in our current budget, and this is outlined um, on this slide. Um, we've seen an increase in cost of supplies, services, and supply chain delays, which have uh, delayed some projects that we plan for this year. We have also had challenges in recruiting and hiring seasonal staff, and vandalism and incidents in parks. However, there are many benefits to enjoying or visiting a park or walking on a trail. We study da data through our program registration and crowd numbers at our community events and walking or walking by tennis courts or filled pickleball courts. 
that five activities on this slide indicate um, areas where we, that have grown in participation in the past two years. The department tracks participation in all program areas, and we are fortunate that we are seeing these numbers increase. This slide represents data during 2020 when virtually all programs were canceled and facilities were closed. In 2021, we resumed programs and opened facilities with safety protocols, and are very pleased that our 22 numbers to date are seeing the numbers trend upward. The department's ongoing uh, work to address climate change and advance sustainability are represented in the work done by all program areas. The department's sustainability and climate action team meets monthly to work on goals in the city's climate action plan specific to the department. Three action items that they are currently working on include a green vendor list, a facility maintenance checklist for all department facilities, and the metric tracking spreadsheet that I described in the earlier slide. The department continues to trans, um, the transition from gas-powered equipment to battery-operated equipment. And in the area of urb, uh, landscaping and urb, urban green space, we continue our efforts to plant native tree seedlings and native plants in 13 parks. Urban forestry efforts have been concentrated on the bicentennial tree planting project with continual tree planting, pruning, and removal of hazardous trees. Solar panels have been in place at these facilities since 2018. We track and monitor the savings in all areas where solar panels are installed. Our work in diver diversity, equity, and inclusion includes staff training. The whole department, all of the staff, completed the uh, community bias training. And we have, we have several staff members attending the Indiana Park and Recreation Association DEI training this year. Diversity efforts are also worked on in, at events. We uh, collaborated on an International Food and Arts Festival this year. Uh, diversity in our performing arts series artists, staff recruiting and hiring, and bilingual services. And our Instagram, if you uh, follow us on Instagram, which I hope you do, uh, we now include a description of the pictures that we post on Instagram. Turning uh, some focus on uh, projects that we are undertaking in the department. I'll start with the general obligation bond projects. Um, we have just completed five years of the general obligation bond package. This was a $6.7 million bond package, and I'm happy to say that we completed 50 projects at 27 sites in the past five years, and three of those years we were also building out Switchyard Park. Parks that general obligation projects that are completed, have, that have been completed this year include the Bryan Park Trail, where we have done a new asphalt overlay on the Loop Trail. We added two new boardwalks, um, asphalt connections to the fitness station and the North Shelter, and ADA compliant crossings into the park. The Accessibility Fishing Pier and point five, uh, point 0.5 section of the Griffey Loop Trail was officially opened and celebrated at the 50-year anniversary of the Griffey Lake Nature Preserve this summer, and this is quickly turning into a beautiful place to watch the sunsets in Bloomington. The next project that has been completed this year is the Lower Cascade Park Phase 5 Trail and uh, stream bank stabilization, and I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all in the community to the ribbon cutting of this project on Sunday, September 18th from 1 to 4 p.m. And while you're there, you can enjoy the new tiered limestone blocks that give safe access down to the creek a little bit closer or walk on the accessible trail that can take everyone now back to the waterfall. Enjoy a picnic on uh, the, the restored limestone picnic tables. Observe all the new trees that have been planted um, and just enjoy our oldest park in the park system. The 2022 Park General Obligation Bond Package that was just passed this year, we have two pro pro 
projects in this package. One is the Griffey Loop Trail Dam Crossing. That is a permitted and shovel-ready project that will take people safely across the dam, connecting the north and the south ends of the Loop Trail. And the second project is to replace a little bit of sidewalk outside Switchyard Park along Rogers Street. Again, this uh, project is going through the floodway permitting process, um, is under design, and we hope to build this in 2023. Now turning our attention to bicentennial bond projects. Uh, the Griffey Loop Trail, the next and final phase of this project um, will occur this year. And this will be um, a combination of new trail or reusing and improving existing trail to protect the shoreline and to keep uh, hikers safe along the trail. The second project is the East-West Trail or the Power Line Trail, again uh, taking you back down to Switchyard Park. The trailhead will be right across from the entrance to Switchyard Park. We are currently working with Monroe County officials on an easement agreement, uh, waiting for Duke to finish up their work along there, and we can progress with uh, design and construction in 2023. Another gateway project area are, um, another gateway, another bicentennial project area are two gateways. This hit a little bit of a stall during COVID, but we're back on track in schematic designs. We have two locations. One is the Arlington Bridge that is owned by the Indiana Department of Transportation. So we're a little limited there, but we would like to include some uh, landscaping on either side of the bridge and perhaps some lettering on the bridge welcoming uh, people to Bloomington. And the second site is on the the very north end of the Miller Showers Park, and that design uh, will include limestone features, trees, landscaping, lighting, and a sidewalk. Also in the Bicentennial Bond Package is tree planting. Uh, we identified 270 um, areas for new trees in four neighborhood areas. And this spring, we planted 85 trees, and we have 117 trees scheduled to be planted this fall. And currently, staff are working to identify 90 additional uh, replacement sites uh, to place bicentennial trees. And the final project I'd like to highlight this evening is the goat farm that will be renamed the Rogers Family Park. Uh, in 2007, the Rogers family donated this 31-acre parcel right along the Jackson Creek Trail. We have a completed schematic design and signed contracts. We will begin construction this month. Very excited about that. And the end result will be to celebrate the quiet and natural space. We will be um, including a loop trail, a trail through the existing prairie, expanding native plants, um, installing a small uh, shelter and repairs to the exterior of the existing barn and silo. This project also includes a public art piece. We worked in collaboration with the Bloomington Area Arts Council and selected a piece, uh, piece titled Fleeting by artist Jonathan Rasick. Uh, spending just a little bit of time, we're going to kind of race through these um, these uh, slides on the 2022 budget goal updates um, as you receive the mid-year report. The department actually has a total of 72 goals and to date we have accomplished 17 with 51 goals in progress. I will just highlight a goal for each area because I feel it's very important that all of our staff see their work represented in, in these budget hearings. So in administration, we are working, getting very close to putting all of our seasonal, seasonal employees on time track and community relations has um, upgraded their QR code that now links to an audio file file that can be played and used uh, to in a translation software into various languages in the operations division they continue their work installing LED lighting and landscaping is busy removing invasive vegetation at various parks that's an ongoing project um, in urban forestry, they uh, initiated a green jobs program with Canopy Bloomington, and we're looking forward to extending that partnership in 2023. And Natural Resources still hopes to complete a prescribed burn at Griffey Lake yet this year, but it's also weather dependent. And finally, at the cemetery, we are building a scatter garden, which is scheduled to open in 2023. 
In the recreation division, they are putting the final touches on their kitchen to receive a commercial kitchen license to be able to teach cooking classes. And community events, along with public works, uh, completed the Bollard project out in City Hall parking lot, which is also the site of Farmer's Market. At Switchyard Park, we made some um, drainage improvements to one of the lawns and an area near the dog park. And inclusive recreation uh, is continuing to promote inclusive services to all program areas. Allison Jukebox has an HVAC system to complete yet this uh, project to complete yet this year. And health and wellness has seen um, huge popularity in our drop-in fitness classes at Switchyard Park. Um, so we had folks out there this evening, very, very popular. And in the sports division, uh, business is really good out at the golf course. They had a goal to rent the new clubhouse 16 times, and they've already rented it 56 times. So business is good there. And Frank Southern Center is scheduled to open October 1st, and they have already exceeded their goal for participation in the first half of the season. So we're looking forward to that number going up. In aquatics, we um, are coming to the end of our season. This weekend will be the last weekend for operations at Bryan Park Pool, so we'll start to analyze the attendance data. And then Twin Lakes Recreation Center is seeing a nice return of its members since the pandemic and more usage is up. In community sports services down at Twin Lakes Sports Park, they have a goal uh, to get at least 20 tournaments in, and they're at 19, so fingers are crossed for one more to meet that goal. And at Winslow Sports Complex, we are currently uh, repurposing field number five from a baseball field to natural turf for a uh, soccer user group. Now turning our attention to the 2023 budget goals, we have 88 budget goals um, outlined. Some of them are in your memo, and I'll just highlight a few this evening. In administration, we'd like to take a deeper dive and look and evaluate our pool fever waiver program to make the program more equitable for all who qualify. And community relations would like to replace their uh, really worn out, old, cumbersome sandwich boards with battery powder, powered LED message centers. In the operations division, we would like to do a lot of repairs along the B-line and also some bridge inspections and any associated results from those bridge, bridge inspection repairs. And in landscaping and urban green space, we would like to assess and design a green infrastructure erosion control plan at Park Ridge East. Urban forestry would like to complete year one of calorie pear replacement program by removing and replacing 50 calorie pear trees. And the natural resources would like to install solar panel system at the Griffey Lake Boathouse. Cemeteries has a very old electrical system in their maintenance shop, so they would like to replace that. In recreation, you know when you move in a house and you live in it and you figure out what you missed? Well, at Switchyard Park, we really need a dog wash station. We've heard from the users, um, so we would like to install a rinse water station. And inclusive recreation would like to uh, create a participant reporting and tracking system for all areas in the department. At Banneker, we want to get our preschoolers back post-pandemic, and so really pushing attendance at the third floor, which is just set up perfectly for preschoolers. And community events would like to install the sound equipment that we own, but we need uh, funding to actually install it on the main stage. Also in the rec division, we would like to uh, initiate a punch card system for the fitness classes, and at Allison Jukebox, we'd like to create a garden for our Kids City participants at the Waldron Hill Buskirk Chumley Park. In the sports division, it's all about our revenue streams. Um, we want to increase uh, revenue across the board here, and at the golf course, we want to uh, see the driving range numbers increase. We'd like to see uh, hourly rentals at the ice arena increase, and aquatics still pushing for more attendance, and at Twin Lakes uh, Rec Center, increased facility rentals to tournament directors and event promoters. Also in the sports division, using Twin Lakes, Rec Center, uh, Twin Lakes Sports Park and Winslow, we would like to book more youth tournaments, and we are currently in discussions with a few tournament directors. Looks like we have about 14 weekends already filled for next year, so pretty excited about that. So now turning to our budget request by category. 
Category one, our personnel request is 6,799,774. This is an 8% increase. This increase is in five new positions that we have requested. All of these positions, um, except for one, the, the four person and the three laborer positions, we have reallocated seasonal funding from this year's budget towards these full-time positions. Uh, that addresses the struggle we're having in hiring um, seasonal staff, so we want to, to go for full-time staff. Also, these areas have seen just an increase in park usage, so park maintenance uh, tasks are up. We are working hard at, at uh, Switchyard Park by having two four persons there. We will be able to have seven day a week coverage. And then the sports services specialist, that's actually an unfilled position we've had for a couple of years. We've done a bit of a reorganization and would like to have a sports specialist position to support Frank Southern and the two sports complexes. Also in category one is our seasonal wages. And of course, we um, are keeping up with the consumer price index here. So we will be paying $15.29 an hour up to $17.23 an hour for our seasonal positions. In category two, supplies, our request is 888,785. And as I mentioned, cost of goods and supplies have gone up and that has hit us in this category. Supplies such as agricultural supplies, chlorine, graffiti removal supplies, playground surfacing material. Fuel is in category two and we've been hard hit there. Um, we'd like to purchase a new shelter for Building and Trades Park. We have a drainage project at Sherwood Oaks Park. We'd like to replace shade structures at four parks and some drinking fountains and some wildlife resistant waste receptacles. In category three, our request is 3,260,046. This is a 33% increase. And our highlights in this area, again, the cost of services have gone up. We've seen some increase in utilities. Um, we have startup costs at Frank Southern and closed down costs. And oftentimes when you're opening a facility for the season, plumbing goes or HVAC goes. We have some older facilities, so always preparing for that. Um, this is also where our security contract is in category three, security contract for Switchyard Park and the Beeline Trail and nine downtown parks. And our partnership agreement with Centerstone is also in category three. We'd like to finish our trail branding project and install some electrical connections for hopefully funded electrical mowers that are in our budget request. Category four, uh, there is no budget request, so that is a decrease, a 100% decrease. But the next slide will explain why. And this is our budget request for American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, and this request is 1,071,100, and that is a 1% increase over our current ARPA funding. The ARPA funding in this year's budget was for revenue replacement loss from 2020. And our 2023 request is for capital projects, battery operated equipment, and battery operated vehicle purchases. Um, one of the big items also in this is the replacement of the five to 12 year old playground at Bryan Park, which is 25 years old and is in need of replacement. Um, and also uh, we would like to winterize the spray pad restrooms at Switchyard Park to convert them to year round restrooms. Um, and add an LED triple-sided digital message board down at Switchyard Park and uh, replace some garden fencing at Butler Park Gardens. So in summary, our total budget request is $12,013,705. And the next slide will split that out by category. So we have um, uh, let's see, 1,071,100 in ARPA funding, 10,942,605 in the Parks General Fund for again a, a total of 12,013,705. And the conclusion again, just a uh, reminder and of our master plan goals that guides our work and guides our strategic action plan and budget goals to take care of what we have, maintain the assets that we have, uh, reinforce activities that promote 
public health, sustainability, and climate, continue to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion, and develop administrative and staffing capacities. So I'd like to thank you for your consideration and your support, always your support for our department and uh, your support for our goals that we've outlined for you this evening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director McDevitt. Uh, Councilman Morello, please kick us off. Thank you, Chair Flaherty. Thank you, uh, Director McDevitt, for your presentation. Um, my first question is about, this should be about six years ongoing of deer control and monitoring in Griffey, I, if, if I'm not mistaken. And then we, we monitor the herbivory pressure by plant indicators there. And I wondered about the success of that uh, and if it's still ongoing. Okay, great. Thank you for your question. Yes, it is still ongoing. And uh, we um, have been studying this. We have a contract f to study the plants uh, and the tree seedlings and how it's going, but I can give you a quick update here. While you're looking, I have, you've got it? Okay. Yes. So um, this dates back, uh, actually we've, uh, dates back six years. We've been studying it a lot longer, um, but in 2017 we did the sharpshooting and removed 62 deers. And then starting in 2019 through 2020, we were part of the community hunting access program that was um, through the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Mm -hmm. And through that grant, we were able to um, hire white buffalo who did the sharp shooting, but that's their area of expertise. So they come down through that program and do the hunter assessment and training and assign areas. So I can tell you in total from the past four years, we have removed 175 deer from that site. Um, we continue to monitor the, uh, the regeneration of the understory plants and we do see recovery occurring, um, not only with the plants, but also um, some tree seedlings coming back. Um, and that's an ongoing, we have a contract every year that uh, Ecologic goes out and studies that. Yeah, I go out there quite a bit too. And you know, I'm, f I'm familiar with forest ecology a bit. and. Um, I wondered, if, it looks to me like, at least in certain areas, there's a legacy effect of a decade or more of, of deer overabundance. And, and so I wondered if there was any talk about exploring the idea of, of, of doing restoration there to, to replace the understory. In other words, planting plants or scattering seed or something like that that would, that would assist that, because the, the, you know, when you've got an empty niche, you're gonna have invasives come in, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, great suggestion. That would be something that our uh, landscaping urban green space, they have a very robust replanting uh, reforestation project that they're doing in other parks, and I will certainly pass that along to them. Great. My time's up for now, but I have other questions later. Thanks. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. And of course, um, your presentations are always visually delightful, so thank you for that. It's always a pleasure to uh, save the, uh, the interesting photographs for our last presentation of the evening. My question has to do with the amount of dollars that have been spent on the security services for parks. I know that was something that was added. How This past year, we've had a real increase in vandalism. Is that kind of the... That, that's, that's ongoing. Uh, we first entered into a security contract in 2021 and that was sort of reactionary because we were getting overwhelmed and uh, we were able to tap into um, some CARES funding for that and it proved to be very very successful with the contractor that we use so uh, we expanded on that um, this year and uh, we are very pleased with how that is going of course it's not taking care of everything but it is absolutely reduced um, the number of U reports, the number of um, incidents, you know, on a, a regular basis, because we have eyes on the park now. So they are present at Switchyard Park. People see them. Um, it's also that sense of security. They are rotating throughout that park, talking to park visitors and that. Um, and then this year we added to the contract uh, security up and down the Beeline Trail. That's been very helpful. Oftentimes they are the first ones on a scene or an incident, which is helpful as well. Well, um, they are present in Seminary Park and, and nine 
parks kind of in, in the downtown area. They support our park maintenance staff who um, are in our parks daily. Uh, doing park maintenance and cleaning up, Seminary Park is a park that sees um, a lot of maintenance that is necessary and the, the security uh, staff are there with them. We have a really good working relationship between um, our staff, the security staff, and BPD, so it's a real coordinated effort. And we're very pleased, not only are we pleased, our staff are pleased, um, they feel supported, and I think our community feels that uh, we are paying attention to safety and security. Are, are these 24-7 services or a certain times? Uh, we have a schedule for them, but they're almost 24 four hours. Uh, they, uh, there's different shifts that come mm -hmm. on, um, but we do have a presence from um, late afternoon, early evening until 1 in the morning, and then there's another shift that comes on at 5 in the morning when the parks open and um, stay until the afternoon. So we feel pretty good and haven't had to adjust that schedule. Do we have a breakdown of costs? How much is this costing? Uh, yes, that's. Uh, I can get you the exact cost um, in the budget. Happy to do that. Thanks. Additional council member questions? Uh, council member Smith. Thank you, Ms. McDevitt, for, Director McDevitt, for doing all these things. Uh, in, in, in the uh, in the next year or so, um, wh what's uh, going on as far as a, a new initiative that we need to know about? Oh gosh, well, uh, all of the projects that I listed, I think we're we're um, excited in all divisions. I'll say that, which is very exciting. I think our marketing and social media division um, is excited about the response we're getting on social media um, and marketing. Our recreation division is excited about the responses we're getting at community events. They still continue to be very, very popular. Um, the sports division is re-energized with our new sports uh, division director, which is exciting, but also uh, changing the things we've done in the sports division to fill capacity and bring people in. Um, and then operations, just being able to ask for funding for big projects is very, very excited. We have staff who are very passionate about the work that they do, so replacing the uh, playground at Bryan Park is just tremendous. Um, as I mentioned in Switchyard Park, we've lived there now for two years, and there's a few things that we need to adjust, so I know the staff there are very excited about the opportunities. We have a, a, a trail there that people have forged behind the stage to get to the parking lot, which was an official trail so one of our budget requests is to make that an official trails yes thank you very much I appreciate it additional questions council members not seeing any up oh, council member Rallo, go ahead no. second round sure in second round yep. okay um, so I'm, I'm very interested in invasive control and I, I'm very heartened that you're removing 50 calorie pairs or Bradford pairs um, this has got to be a small number relative to the number of trees. I mean, there must be hundreds, maybe thousands in the community. Um, and, it, you know, it's disheartening to go into the county and see them popping up everywhere, knowing that they probably originated the propagation, came from here, from street trees and so forth in the past, not under your mm -hmm. direction of Parks and Rec. You're trying to do something about it. How much money do we devote to invasive control? Do you, do you know? Um, I would I would have to look into the budgets and, and get that information to you. Okay, because I think it's a really valuable thing that we we do, you know, and I'm very happy about the controlled burn idea. I think that's great at Griffey. Wish we could do it at Goat Farm. Uh, I don't know if it might work there. I mean, I suppose, you, you know, it's closer to people's residences, so you'd need to make sure that people who are affected by asthma and things like that mm -hmm. were notified. Um, but uh, I think that's a very good practice and something that could be, you know, it's relatively cheap, you know, and it doesn't use chemicals. So I'd be interested in that number. Uh, I think maybe we should be thinking about devoting more uh, resources to it. I mean, I, I saw someone gave a presentation and it was the B-line and it was Bradford pairs all along the B-line because they mistakenly put them in. And it's just, I'm afraid people are gonna look at those trees and say, oh, I want one of those. 
and, go, and search them out and then plant them in their yards. So even though they do terrible, you know, they're, 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 they're terrible uh, in terms of their invasive. So anyway, I'd like to appreciate that information. Thank you. Okay. Any additional second round questions? Or, uh, sorry, Councilmember Roland, I missed you on the first round. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, noted with interest the uh, Mill Showers Park picture in your presentation, Ms. McDevitt, um, and I note that that was uh, uh, collaboration with CBU, right? Correct. Um, uh, did they initiate the project, or did you, did Parks initiate that project? Like, how did that idea come about? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. The idea for the park or the idea for the gateway? Um, not the gateway. The, the, uh, there's a method to my madness here, but uh, to the park itself as a stormwater wastewater treatment facility. Sure. Uh, thank you. Now, that was before my time, and I was the Recreation Division Director, but sure, I believe, I and I, I can get you the specifics, uh, but we do have, um, it was a collaboration. I'm not sure who went first, but it was a collaboration, and uh, we do have a MOU with them now, and we have divided who's responsible for what areas in, in that park, so that's how we manage uh, maintenance, but I'll be able to, I'd be happy to get you the history of how that all started. Well, the reason I ask is because I'd like to ask the same question about to what extent you collaborate with planning and who initiates ideas like because, uh, uh, you know, I, we debated last year the question of how trails were built and are the trails being built purely for beauty purposes or for transportation purposes? Can they be both? And I guess I'd like you to, uh, to talk a little bit about how you think about trails as transportation as a parks director? We collaborate very, very closely with uh, engineering and planning and transportation in our department. Um, that is a one of Tim Streets, our development and operations development director's um, jobs. And we have, um, we collaborate from when it's just an idea to um, contracting and design. If there is, um, a, right now we're taking a look at the Beeline Trail and some of the intersections there, and that is a collaborative effort that all three of the departments are sitting down together and working through those questions together, and I see that unfolding for future projects as well. Um, I don't really have time to follow up, so I'll wait to the next round, but I'd like to follow up on that question. Thank you for those answers. Um, wasn't the um, Miller Showers project, wasn't that kind of uh, a, a requirement by either state or federal that we had to get out ahead of with, with certain uh, mandates for um, cleaning up the water, if I recall? I mean, so it might have been CBU that... I believe so. I mean, I know get, back then that was our park, that. and they, <laughs> the water was going that way. So um, again, I would be happy to look into the history because and how that all started and what drove that. Yeah, a remediation effort that was actually mm -hmm. driven by some new federal mandates that we had to get in front of mm -hmm. is my memory from a long time ago. <laughs> Any additional questions from council members before we go to the public? Seeing none, uh, we can go to members of the public who would like to comment on the Parks and Recreation Departmental Budget. Uh, if you are in chambers, please approach the podium and uh, any members uh, of the public attending via Zoom, please use the raise hand feature or dial star nine if you've dialed in to indicate that you would like to speak and Deputy Attorney Kulak will help administer that and allow you to unmute uh, after we finish with comments in chambers. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, when the bicentennial bonds were presented to this council in October of 2018, the written description in your packet described one and a quarter million dollars for a Griffey Loop Trail project. Um, it said, quote, project would connect the North Shore to the South Shore on the west side of the lake in the vicinity of the dam. It went on to say explicitly, the additional cost of $1.5 million for a boardwalk along the causeway is not included in the bicentennial bond project funding request. 
in the packet that actually underlined the words is not included. Um, and Council Member Piedmont Smith even verified it during council questions. She said the additional cost of $1.5 million for a boardwalk along the causeway is not included in the bicentennial bond. Is that right? Unquote. And David Williams answered, that is correct. I was actually looking forward to this project because um, it would have connected the Cascades Trail to Griffey Trails on the west end of the lake. And yet, by the time they spent the money, the project on the west side of the lake by the dam was eliminated. Um, it's now funded through geo bonds. And they used the funds on the causeway instead after saying they wouldn't. They decided they would spend the money however they wanted. They didn't have to honor the agreement with this council. That's just one example. You've already heard from me about the Cascades Path, already paid for by taxpayers and then unilaterally canceled by Parks Department. And now I've learned that our engineering department has been told that Parks and Rec is exempt from both state statute and local ordinance, that they are literally above the law. It's bizarre enough that Parks is managing transportation infrastructure, but it's literally criminal that they are doing so without recognizing the absolute necessity for engineers to supervise, not coordinate, supervise transportation facilities. I'm flabbergasted by this situation. The idea of a city department so thoroughly flaunting all forms of oversight is something I just don't know how to deal with. You guys need to fix this. Your oversight is not pro forma. You represent us. You represent the people. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have anyone online who would like to comment? So at this point, there are no hands raised. There was an older comment about something from before, which I can send later or read out loud now, whichever is preferred. Uh, if it's relevant to the Parks and Recreation Department, feel free to read out loud now. If not, please do send it to uh, the council members. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you. And at this point, still no hands raised. Okay. And seeing no one else in chambers for public comment, we will return to council for either additional questions or um, final comments on the Parks and Recreation budget. Uh, Councilmember Rowland. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. Alexander's statement is uh, um, uh, a sentiment that I share. I would like to hear uh, Ms. McDevitt's uh, response to it. I'm concerned about oversight. Or well, perhaps Mr. Underwood uh, can speak to it. I see him, him having come on. I'll speak uh, specifically about the use of bond funds for various projects. This issue has come up before, and, and I, I believe I've tried to make myself very clear to the public and to the council that any funds that have been spent out of bond funds uh, have been used according to the ordinances that were approved by the city council. If there were changes to the particular projects, those were vetted with bond council prior to the expenditure of any funds. and we would not have spent that without the express review and approval by bond council that they were appropriate for that particular bond. Uh, so to say that uh, there was any malfeasance or any other thing going on is completely incorrect and it's unfair that uh, those statements can be made uh, in public without any uh, refute back. Uh, I, I find it disappointing that if those kind of comments were made about council members that, that there would be outrage shown. And quite frankly, we have talked about this at a number of meetings. Uh, and I wanna make it clear again, that the funds were spent according to the ordinances and any changes to the project list was approved by bond council. On the oversight issue of engineer, engineering, I'll let um, uh, Ms. McDevitt speak to that. Uh, b before uh, she continues, I'd like to say that uh, this is the reason why I asked to give uh, staff the opportunity to respond. But my question is more targeted to if the council intended to approve a project that was going to be built on the west side of the lake and it was instead uh, uh, built on the east side, do we have another case of uh, what the police department did uh, with the money for a garage in 20? Uh, 18 that became uh, money for uh, an armored vehicle. Um, it's a matter of oversight. Uh, the the uh, if the it's one thing for the bond council to approve it, but you know, did council get a chance to approve that change? I, I believe uh, Deputy Mayor uh, is still there. Uh, I'm here. If he would I'm here. Answer that on behalf of the administration. We we have gone through this several times. Um, 
there was no malfeasance. Um, if you want to ask a question in regards to something else, that's great, but uh, by now it's almost, uh, it, it's too much. It just really Mr. Is. Chair, uh, if I, Mr. Chair, if I may uh, have some more time to explore this question, I think it's important. I also believe my question is being misrepresented. Uh, your time is up for the moment, Councilmember Bolin. First, I'd like to go to see if there are other questions from council members at this time. No. Um, would it be appropriate to follow up in writing, Councilmember Bolin? I think. The, the questions with, with uh, I, I take issue with the use of the word malfeasance. My question was targeted to why was the scope of the project changed? And, uh, you know, why was that not brought before the council in the same way that the armored truck wasn't brought before the council? We, we actually took action in ordinance to make sure that such a change in scope uh, of, of such a significant amount uh, wouldn't happen again. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't use the word malfeasance, although I, I agree with the, the sentiment of Mr. Alexander. I didn't, I didn't use that word, and I'm not trying to accuse anyone of, of malfeasance here. I'm saying the council approved a project that would do one thing, and something else happened. It, it, and that it, project wasn't particularly focused on connectivity. It was focused on parks. And I don't know. At, I mean, that's, at, that's at this concern. point, at, at this point in time, I think it would be uh, nice if Council Member Volan, uh, if you do have a question, it sounds like a very complicated question. Please put it in writing, and we can send you our response. And I'd like to clarify that I was not accusing Council Member Volan. My my comments were reference to the public comments uh, that were made. Uh, so okay. I, I, I apologize. If you, felt that was intended towards you, it was not. And I, I am not trying to, uh, I mean, I'm trying to ask a complicated policy question here, uh, you know, and I, I, I've urged uh, my colleagues on both the, the council and the administration to uh, take a step down here. It's a reasonable policy question about transportation and its role in the parks department. So I will, I will ask that question in writing. Thank you. I, I'll thank you, Councilmember Roland. Uh, I actually will pick up the question and, and follow up in, in a, I think, narrow and targeted way. Uh, I, I do think the relevant policy questions. One was with respect to, to transportation uh, and engineering oversight. I, I think Mr. Alexander has spoken in public comment before um, with respect to the the reroute uh, around the Johnson Creamery closure. Could you speak, uh, Director McDevitt, at all to? Uh, the decisions or, or sort of chain of command, so to speak, with, with respect to how uh, transportation and traffic control decisions are made with parks department facilities, perhaps on property that, that um, the parks, the Board of Parks Commissioners owns, you know, may not be public right of way or, or, or may be, but um, in any case, you know, not a, a, a traditional street perhaps, but, but a transportation uh, facility nonetheless. How, how is, that decision process pursued between your department engineering and, and within the city context generally? Sure. Um, the examples I have are both on the Beeline Trail uh, during the construction of Switchyard Park. Um, it was a goal to keep that area open as often as we could, but from time to time during construction, we had to close a section of the trail. There was representatives from uh, Planning and Transportation and Engineering at those meetings um, to work with the uh, construction company and with staff. Um, we talked about how long that would be, where the rerouted um, section would be, how we would communicate that to trail users. We had signage that we put out and um, gave several days um, warning to our trail users that a trail use was about to occur and we tried to minimize that as much as we could. The other example I have is the one that we currently have in place out in the parking lot. Um, and again, that was a collaboration. Uh, we were sort of secondary to the smokestack um, issue, but obviously the fall zone was going to affect that section of the Beeline Trail. We consulted um, with our risk department, with uh, the several department heads who 
were involved in that issue. And then we worked as closely, as quickly as we could to reroute, come up with the detour, and sign it. And after some public comment, our original closure was, was not the, were not those orange barricades, but after getting some feedback, we made um, that improvement. And again, that was in uh, consultation with our risk department, engineering, and planning and transportation. Okay, and do you know if, thank you, and, and do you know if the, the traffic maintenance uh, plans that, that you've described, if, the, if those are compliant with the, the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices, or if that's a lens that the engineering department brought, brought to bear on, on the design, the that, MTCD for, <laughs> for short? Yeah, that, that's a lens. As I said, we, we consult with them on projects, and that's exactly what that's about. What does a project look like, and what do we need to be mindful of, and what are the decisions um, that we need to make related to that and our project? Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are more questions <laughs> necessarily unless uh, anyone has one that came to mind. Uh, I think we're, we're concluding with council member questions if, or council member comments. Uh, prior to considering a due pass recommendation. Um, do I see any comments? Councilmember Smith? I, I just want to comment that I use the parks a lot. And, and um, the security's done wonders, so I appreciate that for all your efforts and your department's efforts and your efforts. Uh, I really appreciate you working on the basketball court in response to uh, constituents' concerns. That's really wonderful. And uh, lastly, the Griffey improvements, it, it's fabulously wonderful out there. And um, the Parks Department and, and you and your staff should be commended for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll Councilor Melbourne Bolin. Yeah, I seem to have uh, hit a nerve here. Um, like this isn't about the quality of the Parks Department, which I uh, revere as much as the next council member. I reveled in the two gold medals. I'm very proud of the achievements of the department. Uh, but there's a reason why we have a department now called Planning and Transportation. There's a reason now why engineering is no longer a division of public works. There's a reason why we now have a parking services division in public works. These are all matters that have to do with transportation. It's the reason now why I'm asking about the chain of command when it comes to projects that are at once recreational and transportational. The Beeline Trail is a good example of it. It's not just a lovely place. It's a vital street. It is a street. It is, for all practical purposes, a, a uh, route that people use as a pragmatic matter, of course, to transport themselves from one place to another. It happens to also be nice. It is run by the Parks Department. But the question is, uh, when it comes to matters of transportation, uh, what are parks priorities versus planning's priorities or versus our uh, transportation plan priorities, okay? I mean, parks has its own plan and its own mission, and those are important. But we also have a transportation plan that's part of the UDO. And this question hasn't been sufficiently resolved. I think uh, the, the uh, heat over the financial matter has obscured this part, and that's what I'm trying to highlight here, okay? Uh, trails are transportation. And if we're making decisions about them that are purely aesthetic, uh, or if they uh, go against uh, matters that uh, are called for in our transportation plan, then I think it's right to question them, okay? Who should have oversight over things that could be both beautiful and practical. That's the question I'm asking here. And that's the question I'll be asking in writing, but I would urge everyone to look at it from that lens, okay? I mean, none of this takes away from the quality or the value of parks. 
But let us also not set aside the importance of transportation simply because we are proud of the Parks Department. These are vital questions and they deserve more answers than we were able to get to tonight. Thank you. Additional council member comments? Council member Rallo. Yeah, uh, I just wanna say I appreciate all the work you and your staff do and I also appreciate the projects that you have completed and the ones that you have proposed to do. Um, I also am very impressed that uh, we've continued to win awards for the facilities that we provide for the public, but I'm very much impressed that your department has uh, a record of good ecological stewardship for the, for the land that we, that we oversee, and that's very important. I think it's uh, pretty remarkable what, what we do, especially in the face of adversity and dif difficulty when it comes to things like invasives. So thank you for your presentation. I'll be passing this evening for the reasons I stated before about compensation concerns for staff, but uh, good work. Thank you. Thank you. Other council member comments? Uh, seeing none, I will follow up briefly. Um, I, I do think the, the points that Mr. Alexander has been raising over time are, are, are important to think about and address. I know, uh, you know Mr. Underwood um, feels there were some allegations that, that were unwarranted, uh, and that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. I, I, I will say I, I dug pretty deeply into this last year uh, with city staff with respect to um, the bicentennial bonds and Cascades uh, trails that had been outlined in the, that, that ordinance approving the bonds. Um, this is related, you know, the, the question of that west side uh, Griffey Dam connection, and they're all related to ongoing expenditures with the general obligation bonds that we approved to sort of finish projects that we thought we were getting with the 2018 bonds. I think some of that had to do with things being more expensive than, than you know, otherwise expected and whatnot, but I, I was satisfied at the end of that sort of in-depth uh, dive with, with the administration that, you know, just like Mr. Underwood said tonight, all, all expenditures have been made with the approval of bond council in line with, um, you know, with, with legal requirements in that regard. Uh, where I think we differed was more of this matter of, of fiscal oversight and policy and appropriate level of follow-up with the city council as the approving entity when things go off course. So even if, uh, you know, approved to pursue the, the bond um, uh, that Mr., or the expenditures that, you know, the projects that Mr. Alexander was, was describing with respect to the Griffey, Griffey, um, Griffey Dam and, and uh, Causeway projects, if, if we thought based on, you know, the public meetings and um, the ordinance we approved that, that there would be a west side dam connection uh, as a result of the bond that the council approved, when it became, whenever it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen, the, the administration really needed to come back to the council and, and seek approval for doing something different or explain to us why those expectations were not going to be met. And this has happened actually multiple times with the, with the bicentennial bonds and the, and the parks um, related projects. And, and in, in both instances, they've sort of led to this uh, difficult, uh, you know, public headache around the issue. And I think it's, um, again, not, not alleging any uh, illegal behavior or anything like that. I think, I think uh, again, I was satisfied with respect to bond council's approval of the expenditures. But there's another question of, of what the council is reasonably expecting based on what's represented to it at the time of approval and, and what, what we should be hearing when, when, uh, when things depart from that course. So I, I, I think it's a, an area we still need improvement. I, I did wanna speak to it meaningfully because I think it's a valid uh, concern that, that Mr. Alexander is bringing up. Um, so I appreciate um, folks, folks bearing with us as we have that conversation. Um, that's it for me on, on a, a comment. And with that, uh, unless there are more, we are ready for a um, due pass recommendation on the Parks and Recreation Department budget. Would the deputy clerk please call the roll? Council Member Sandberg. Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? No. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Rosenberger? Volan? Pass. Sims? Yes. And Scambolori. Yes. I believe that vote is 4 1 2. Uh, unless I miscounted, I think 
I think that's what I got. <laughs> uh, thank you, and um, thank you again, Director McDevitt, for your presentation, thank for all you the work you and your department uh, does, and thanks, thanks, uh, yes, thanks for answering our questions. With that, uh, our presentations for the evening are concluded. Just a reminder for folks, we'll be back here at 6 p.m. tomorrow night for the final night of budget hearings, hearing uh, presentations from engineering, or planning and transportation, engineering, and public works departments. Uh, and we have no more business, so we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>